Uh, good morning. Welcome to the 28th meeting of 2017 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Uh, before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as they may affect the broadcasting system. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item five in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are indeed agreed. The the second item of business today is the continua continuation of taking evidence on the committee's uh, inquiry into air quality in Scotland. Uh, the panel this morning, uh, and I welcome all of you, uh, David Duffy, the Junior Vice President of the Royal Environmental Health Institute of Scotland, Dr Scott Hamilton, the Principal Air Quality Consultant at Ricardo Energy and Environment, Vincent McNally, the Environmental Health Officer of Sustainable Glasgow, Glasgow City Council. Good morning. Dennis Milligan, Head of Communications from the Stove Industry Alliance, and Professor Mark Sutton, Environmental Physicist of NERC. Um, members have a series of questions to ask you this morning, gentlemen, um, and we'll kick off with uh, Kate Forbes. Good morning to the panel. I'd like to direct my first question to Professor Mark Sutton to ask how you would update the cleaner air for Scotland to ensure a more integrative and cross-sectoral policy. That's a tough one. Um, so I'm going to speak as a scientist, and my expertise is especially in agriculture and air pollution, uh, especially in the nitrogen cycle. I think my first point would be to say that actually I realise this committee doesn't just deal with air pollution, but deals with other challenges as well, climate challenges, biodiversity challenges. I'm not sure whether that's on your radar. Um, and so my first comment would be not just to see air pollution in isolation, and realize that there are win-wins between different policy sectors. If I consider the nitrogen cycle, which I'm specifically an expert, and so it's not a bad place to start, I would say we are losing substantial amounts of nitrogen into the air as air pollution, and that applies both as NOx, nitrogen oxides, and as ammonia, ammonia primarily coming from agriculture. That air pollution has actually got value as nitrogen. If you multiplied it by the fertilizer price as nitrogen, uh, we're losing a substantial amount of uh, resource, which turns from a resource into pollution. And so I think that actually encourages us, when looking to your question of more integration, to think of what is the value of the thing which we've lost, which started out as a resource and then became pollution where we didn't want it. And if I just give an example on the agriculture side, and I take total European uh, nitrogen emissions, uh, the value of that is about, from agriculture alone, 14 billion euro per year. 14 billion euro per year. That is about a quarter of the total common agricultural policy budget of 57 billion euro a year. So, actually, we're losing from agriculture a massive value. We're losing several further more billion as nitrogen oxides, if we could ever learn not just to destroy nitrogen oxides, but to capture it as a resource. Um, of course, that might help us go further on an international level than we'd gone before. So I think when I think about your question about integration for air quality, my first point is think beyond air quality. Think of pollution as once being a resource uh, that can help you meet several of the other goals. So uh, taking nitrogen is contributing to air pollution to ammonia pollution affecting biodiversity, to particulate matter affecting human health, nitrogen oxides of NO2 affecting human health. They're all in a way linked. And so let's say a more circular economy perspective could help us. I think that kind of thinking might actually also then start helping us in other sectors as well, but I'm less of an expert in those. Great, thank you very much. Um, if I could then move on to uh, Scott Hamilton and ask who I believe is here on behalf of Ricardo. Yes, um, how Ricardo considers um, whether the effectiveness of the strategy and its relevant policies have been constrained by a lack of input from businesses and private sector organisations. And depending on your answer to that one, how would you change that? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. So uh, I think um, it's actually quite difficult from the outside looking in really to... I guess to really understand CAFs in a lot of detail. Um, we are not very involved in the, the sort of uh, evolution of the, the, the programme, uh, although we, we do a lot of work for the Scottish Government 
um, we run the measurement networks and manage the uh, Scottish Air Quality Database, etc. But we, we haven't really had any involvement so much in in, in, in CAFs. Um, I think our uh, response to the consultation question was was more about um, um, we probably would have had quite a lot to give to the process. Um, but it just wasn't possible for, for, for whatever um, reason. Although I, I, I think um, uh, the focus is naturally on road traffic, but there are other sectors that are important for air pollution in, in Scotland, one of them being the industrial sector and commercial sectors. And um, there, there's not a lot of focus on any of the other source types and, and CAFs that maybe private industry would be naturally interested if there was additional controls on emissions from, say, commercial sector, industrial sector. Um, thanks. Good. Um, and then, um, uh, Vincent McAnally, um, if I could ask you around uh, how Glasgow City Council um, monitors progress against air quality targets and what performance indicators do you think would be useful at a national level in light of your experience at the local level? Um, well, Glasgow um, reports annually in its annual progress report on the air quality that's monitored across the city. Uh, we have an extensive network of monitoring locations, over 100 monitoring locations within the city, uh, and we report on them annually. And we can show the trends, uh, which has generally been of improvement across the city uh, over the past uh, five years. Um, and we have monitoring data going back much longer than that. Um, the network has been expanded year on year. Uh, we are in, uh, in the process of ad adding more PM 2.5 monitors that will be, should be in place for the start of 2018. Um, and, and I think the, the performance indicators that are important um, for the city is what is the trend in air quality in Glasgow and what are the levels that are being recorded. And it's generally a good news story in Glasgow we have over 97% of the city meeting all air quality targets, including the Scottish and uh, World Health Organization targets for particulates, which are the most demanding in Europe, the most demanding in the UK. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that, as a performance indicator, shows where we are and how well we're doing. Can I, can I just um, allow a couple of members and with slightly tangential questions around the monitoring? Um, Emma Harper. Yes, thank you very much, um, convener. I'm interested in, like, Glasgow City Council, for instance, have you thought about monitoring roundabout schools by putting monitors, pollution monitors, uh, NOx monitors on lollipop persons? Because then you would be able to measure what's happening at school time when schools go in, schools go out, and then in between times if there's a, an issue. The, the local air quality management regime is quite uh, clear about where is a suitable monitoring location, and it's not uh, based on personal exposure, uh, such as you're mentioning, which would be uh, maybe a person could wear or walk about with. It is based on fixed monitoring locations. Uh, and with regard to schools, um, we are lucky in that we don't have any schools in Glasgow uh, where air quality targets are not being met. There's none of them. Um, we have air quality monitoring stations. We have the full air quality monitoring station in one school and the other uh, schools within the city centre we have uh, NO2 diffusion tubes located just to provide um, uh, comfort to uh, parents and concerned citizens that air quality targets are being met within the schools. Um, so, so that's positive in terms of the monitoring that's done and what's been found. Uh, of course there are still issues with kids having to walk past lines of cars that are sitting idling, waiting for, um, you know, parents waiting to pick them up at the school gates. Um, the, the targets, the, uh, the, the objectives that we're required to meet are not being exceeded at those locations, but it is uh, exposure to pollution that uh, would be better avoided. Uh, and to that end, we have in the past gone out and done uh, vehicle idling enforcement outside schools where we have issued fixed penalty notices to uh, parents of uh, school children uh, when they've been picking them up, um, which was not very well received, but uh, um, it has to be done. Uh, Scott Hamilton. Uh, I, just, I wanted to contribute that um, 
an actual fact what we're talking about here is uh, very very small concentrations of trace gases as we would call them it's actually very challenging to reliably measure gases and, and, and particles at the concentrations that are represented in the standards um, taking personal measurements um, to my knowledge there, there are no portable measurement methods that are sensitive enough to characterize air pollution at the levels uh, that we would typically understand as being problematic. Um, the uncertainty uh, and measurements of the type that you mentioned would be very high and would be very difficult to reliably, reproducibly take those measurements and be confident that the results were reliable. Um, and that's a technological issue, it's just we, we don't have the measurement methods to do that right now. Okay. Uh, I think uh, John Scott has a question for Mark yes, Sutton. I have. Um, thank you. Um, and just to go beyond monitoring and um, to develop the theme of, of Professor uh, Mark Sutton's idea of, of uh, these NOx gases and ammonia, um, we had a long conversation at the NERC reception about this. And um, is there any clever chemistry out there about treating these gases, as you suggest, as a resource, as, as something to be harvested, um, this 14 billion euros of nitrogen? Well, it's not all wasted, but certainly there must be some runoff in agriculture, but there's also roadside gases that could perhaps be harvested. You, one can see self-evidently roadside verges that the, the grasses grow better close to the road than they do even 10 feet away from the road, and that's simply a function of the the nitrogen uh, element of the of the pollution. So is there any way that you can think in terms of clever chemistry that we might actually look at turning this into a resource and, uh, and an asset? So I think we're at the, I'd say, the cusp of this discussion where some technologies are beginning to run and others are still in our mind about how to, how to get there. The first stage, of course, is this change of thinking towards really saying, well, let's go and see what we can achieve with this. Um, I think where we're at already in achieving this is uh, technologies to reuse uh, liquid streams from farming. Um, so if you think about uh, a set of cows, for example, or a lot of pigs, um, they're producing urine and solid manure. Um, that, of course, will typically nowadays be just put straight back onto the field with a surface spreader. Um, the problem with that is it's giving so much up into the atmosphere because it's covering all the surfaces and the main pollutant there is ammonia. Um, what they're doing in some parts of Europe now is, um, and this is actually curiously enough driven by the nitrates directive, so we've got another link between air pollution and another policy domain. Um, they couldn't put more than a certain amount of organic manure onto the field. So they would pay somebody else to take it away. The guy that's taken it away now has a bit of money and the manure. First off, he's doing anaerobic digestion and getting some methane of it. And secondly, what's left is a liquor which is rich in nitrogen and phosphorus. And so they warm it a bit, strip off the ammonia, and put it together with an acid and sell the product back to the fertilizer companies. So you've actually got the basis of a circular economy uh, going. And that is already happening. Um, and of course, it's a question of how to get it profitable. Um, I think the next one with, the, with the, the NOx come from the other angle entirely, our vehicle exhausts. All our technologies really to date are focusing on turning that NOx, N-O-X, back into atmospheric nitrogen. That's the form N2. And that's 78% of every breath we take is N2, but it's completely unreactive. Not much use for anything apart from providing a nice stable atmosphere. Um, but if we can get that NOx and turn it into nitrate, again, we've got a potential resource. And that is where we're still, I'd say, at the cusp of development, um, because that's a long way away from yet making that economic into the future. Um, but imagine the world's nitrogen oxide emissions, and that's about um, 40 million tonnes. So I'll, I'll say that that's something like about $40 billion worth a year of NOx, which we're currently treating as pollution. In the future, the question would be, can we then improve our technologies to wash that out commercially? And, and then, of course, bring down the price of air pollution abatement. And the roadside verges one, as I think, is an interesting one. And the, the challenge we face again with these will be to make them economic in a way that uh, whoever's managing, be it a roadside company or, or, or a farmer, uh, gets enough to make it worth his while. Uh, take, for example, what would be coming out of uh, field drains. 
Um, of course, if, if that's not been run well, they may have substantial nitrate leaching. I think it's a challenge for the future to capture that nitrate leaching and get it back into the farm and back onto the crop where we want it. So, forgive me for being so stupid, but my chemistry is so out of date, but what's the equation that takes N2O to nitrogen plus oxygen? What, how do you split up that molecule into... Uh, there will be a chemical piece of chemistry somewhere, although I don't remember what it yes, is. Yes, well, there's, there's several ways of doing it. Um, the first thing to realise is that nitrogen is a bit challenging because it's, it's got these several forms. So the first form is the N2, two nitrogen atoms together. That's 78% mm -hmm. of every breathe. breath we breathe. Um, the next you just mentioned was N2O, and that's a greenhouse gas. So that's really unreactive. Once we've lost that, it's really hard to do much with it. I actually meant um, NO2. N, 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 N2O. And then the next one is NO, and that's nitric oxide. And that's the one that forms very rapidly to form nitrogen dioxide. So it's the one we're used to in the cities. Um, if you add a bit more oxygen, you can convert that NO2 into nitrate, which is NO3. So you just got to add one more oxygen, and you might do that by a number of ways um, but basically an ozone-rich, uh, an oxygen-rich source uh, to convert that to nitrate. Uh, Scott Hamilton wants to come in there. Um, I just wanted to make uh, the observation. Uh, I think in answer to your question, the, the simple answer is no. Uh, right now, there's no technology to remove uh, NOx from the atmosphere at roadside that would, well, align with the CAF's objectives of reducing exposure to uh, NO2. There's no technology, and the, the compounding factor is that we're not just uh, traffic emissions, they're a complex mixture of NOx, volatile organic compounds, particles, metals. Um, so you would, I, I would imagine there would be a, an issue of having to deal with those sort of nasties uh, alongside the thing that you want to keep. But right now there's no technology to, to, to but, rely on. No, but there is a simple natural technology of grasses obviously absorb <laughs> these uh, nitrogen uh, compounds, uh, and you know, that's there to manifest. To see it, probably sulphur as well helps the growth of the grasses, but um, and therefore uh, environmental enhancement such as grass or trees by the roadside presumably that captures some of these gases. Is, is that not? Is that not? A um, I mean, my experience um, primarily, I'm a, 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 an air quality modeler, an atmospheric scientist, mm -hmm. and to my, my experience thus far has been that grass has absolutely no effect on concentrations uh, at roadside. Uh, trees can have a, 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 an effect, but it can be a compounding effect of slowing down wind speed, which increases concentrations of some gases. So it's not, there's, there's no straightforward fix, unfortunately. Um, reducing emissions at source is the most reliable way to deal with this issue, not to deal with the emissions once they've been released from the source. Uh, I don't want to get bogged down in this, but Mark Sutton, do you want to come back? Yeah, I'll just come back with a quick one. I think, um, I think actually we, we agree broadly, and, and the key thing is once it's out in the atmosphere, it's hard to deal with. Uh, you want to keep it either not emitting or in your source or captured at, at source. Uh, in the case of vegetation to recapture near roadside verges, we have to make a distinction here between there are higher levels near roadside verges, which means the dose to that vegetation will be bigger than if it hadn't been near a road. That can start having biodiversity effects if you're trying to protect biodiversity near roads. Um, but quantitatively, quantitatively, in terms of the fraction removed from the air, it will be very modest, very small. And so this debate about trees in the urban environment when it comes to NOx uh, is a challenging one. The main benefit or threat actually will be through the dispersion effect. So if you're the other side of the trees, the air may have been dispersed better and you'll have better air quality the other side of the trees. But if you're in a street canyon protected by trees, you'll have higher concentrations. Um, and, and the last <laughs> distinction to make is that these different gases have got different removal rates that NO, NO2, coming out of cars, deposits very slowly. That means there's very little potential for recapture. The ammonia deposits faster. There is some ammonia coming out of catalytic converters as well. So it depends on your gas. Vincent McAnally. I'll keep it brief. Um, it was just to mention the fact that we have, in Glasgow, introduced two what they call city trees this year, which are freestanding moss walls, if you like, um, which are planted with a particular... Uh, types of herbs and, and mosses that are 
uh, shown to be more effective at capturing pollution, uh, pollutants from the air. Um, these are, as I say, freestanding units. They're much cheaper to install than uh, just actually planting a tree within an urban environment. Um, they are self-contained, so they capture their own rainwater. They're solar-powered that pumps through them. Uh, and there may be an option for us to introduce more of them in the future. That sounds fascinating. Can I just ask you a, a further question? Um, the Hope Street hotspot, as I understand it, the monitoring station is very close to a taxi rank. Is that the case? Um, or maybe the taxis are close to the monitoring station. Well, <laughs> um, they're further away now than they used to be because we put new bollards up to try okay. and stop the taxis backing up to it. Um, Hope Street is a very busy street. Uh, and the taxis contribute to that levels of pollution within it. So yes, uh, but the, the monitoring station is capturing everything that's that's within that street, and the modelling that's been done on air quality in Hope Street takes account of that. So it's not skewed by the the, the fact that the taxis are so close by. It's capturing the correct levels of pollution in the street. And given the uh, comments you made earlier about issuing fixed penalty notices outside schools, has the council taken any action of that type? with the taxi rank if they find taxis uh, idling? We've taken a lot of action against taxi drivers and bus drivers uh, to the point where they recognise the enforcement officers before they see them. Um, <laughs> there is a problem with taxi ranks, and the official guidance says that, you know, the vehicle has to be uh, idling unnecessarily, and that's generally taken as being over a couple of minutes, it's been sitting there. It doesn't have to be two minutes. If the driver's outside smoking a cigarette and his engine's on, he can get a ticket straight away. But it's idling unnecessarily. In the ranks, they move up so quickly in the ranks that they don't stay stationary long enough for us to issue a ticket. Because mm. if we're timing them, it's literally 30 seconds and they creep up the rank. You have to start the clock again. You're not able to issue them with a ticket. OK, it's good to get that on the record. Kate Forbes, you want to continue? Yeah, I've got two final ones, and I'll ask them together in the interest of time. The first one directed at Dennis Milligan, followed by um, David Duffy. And it's to do with um, studies that have been... If you can enlighten us as to studies that have been carried out into the impact of domestic wood burning on air quality. Is it possible to estimate how much wood is burnt domestically in Scotland and to differentiate the amount burnt in open fires, approved wood burning stoves and unapproved stoves? Question one. And then question two, and this is a free for all, um, uh, whether you believe the Clean Air Act of 1994 effectively deals with emissions and is it adequate? adequately enforced and how do you think it should be amended? So Dennis okay. Milligan and then David Duffy. Well the, the Bayes study looking at domestic wood usage in 2015 showed that 40% of the wood burnt in Scotland was actually burnt in open fires and we're obviously arguing that's the worst way to burn wood in that uh, if, if you control the burn you can control the, the, the emissions that are, that are coming from it by because most, most PM from wood burning is, is due to incomplete combustion of the wood. So uh, in an open fire, you have lots of incomplete combustion, so therefore you, ha you have more and more emissions. Um, Dr. Fuller of King's College uh, 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 earlier this year presented a study that he'd done across all the monitoring stations uh, in the UK, and he found that the level of, of wood burning emissions was dropping in each of the cities. So it was dropping slightly both in Glasgow and, and in Edinburgh. And the reason he put down to that was really the replacement of open fires and older stoves with DEFRA exempt stoves. So really what we're trying to educate people about now is uh, the new European uh, level for our control for emissions, which is equal design, which is due to come in in 2022 for uh, wood burning stoves. As an, as an association, we're, we're, bringing them in, we're bringing them in now and we've committed by 2020 to, to meet the, the emissions. These will reduce the emissions from a stove by 55% compared to a DEFRA stove. And 90% compared to an open fire or a stove manufactured 10 years ago. So really the technology has moved on and we're able to, we're able to capture the, the emissions uh, you know, within, within the stove before they're released into the atmosphere. Just before we go any further, can someone quantify for me the extent to which fires and stoves are uh, part of the problem? Is it a significant contributor to this issue? Is it a minor one? Somebody, David Duffy. Um, thank you. Um, it's not completely known because of the way that the stoves um, come into use. There's, in response partly to Kate's question, um, the Clean Air Act gives some uh, exemptions for smoke control areas and restrictions on types of stoves can, that can be used in those areas. However, they were set up historically 
uh, in line with where coal was being delivered, um, and it was to tackle the problem of the cleaning racks in the past. What's happened or the culture that's been created just now is that people are encouraged to use wood burning stoves or other methods to, to burn. There's some climate change conflict there with air quality and that we're encouraging people to use what we see as a renewable source, however it's actually producing more pollution if it's used correctly. Um, part of the problem is that there's a gap within the developmental control of stove installation and in that if you already have an existing chimney uh, or an existing pot, then uh, you may not need to have building control. Uh, you may not need to have planning permission to put that in. People will put them in without kind of considering planning or neighbours um, to put the stove units in. So whilst they can be very efficient and also meet air quality targets, it's the unregulated or the gap within this. Uh, the Clean Air Act had uh, significant consultation and questions put on that, and certainly the comments back from REHIS and from other agencies have highlighted this um, during the consultation process. That's where the kind of gap is. Or we believe the gap is, the problem is actually knowing where that's demonstrable to be said, this is the problem here. Um, a lot of CAFs um, for Clean Air for Scotland is set up towards transport uh, and transport issues rather than looking at, as was suggested, at other areas of um, contribution to pollution, agriculture, domestic burning, uh, heating, these other elements. So the problem associated with, or the perceived problem associated with stoves may not be fully um, understood. Uh, Scott Hamilton. <clears throat> um, so my organisation did some research for Scottish Government back in 2008 and we, we published, uh, the government published uh, uh, a paper on the subject of wood burning uh, in, in cities and what that would be possibly contributing to PM10 and PM2.5. Um, given that that's quite out of date now, it's 2008, I think when we looked last time, we reckoned it was probably about a microgram or so of PM10, something about less than that for PM2.5 in Edinburgh and Dundee. Um, we didn't look at Glasgow in that study, but um, I don't think there's much reason to suspect that that will change very much. Um, so that was the last time I think we looked holistically at a large area of Scotland and tried to quantify that number. So. David Duffy and then Dennis Milligan. Thank you. Uh, REHIS, um, the Professional Institute, helped support a forum which is called SPCCC, or I abbreviated to that, it's the Scottish Pollution Control Coordinating Committee. And it's the engagement of local authorities in SEPA with Scottish Government officials. And we did uh, have planners coming to speak to um, at SPCCC on another subject, but they brought up the issue of permitted development rights for um, installation of stoves to see whether a baseline could be drawn. Um, and that was given back to the planners at that time, but we haven't seen anything coming forward. That would help with... Um, future developments um, of sites that we would come across to say, are you meeting the permitted developments right? If you meet the permitted developments right, you don't have to apply for planning permission um, and you've got something that's satisfactory. However, the problems are that come back from the forum, because it represents the 32 local authorities, are for local problems where an unregulated unit's been put in and the chimney height of the exhaust fume is pluming down and affecting someone else, which, whilst small contribution to the overall air quality um, figures for Scotland does give a very, very local problem that has to get tackled. So on the one hand, they're meeting perceived building regulations and planning and are authorised by the local authority are not impacted. And on the other hand, environmental health, who I'm speaking on behalf of, uh, are coming back and saying, you can't have that stove there um, because it's affecting someone next to it. So it would be beneficial if there was the gap within the development controlled and also some assistance in informing the public as to what they can do in this area before they go ahead with it. Thank you. Uh, Dennis Milligan. Could I just say two things? One, the first is that in England and Wales it's a notifiable event if you are going to install a stove, so building control is immediately involved or else it's handed to a competent person who, who obviously again is authorised to, to survey and install install the stove. So really, you know, I didn't realise that it wasn't a notifiable event in Scotland, so I think that would be an improvement where, you know, the installation was covered properly to make sure that it, that it, it does, uh, you know, do its best to disperse the emissions. Second point was really in terms of the impact of stoves. Um, 
I rely a lot upon what I, what I, what I, what I learned from, from King's College and really the, the estimate that Dr. Fuller puts out for London, and I apologise it's London, but basically he's saying that it, at a wintertime peak of emissions of PM, uh, it would probably be, but still wood burning would be contributing 10%. But in London, 70% of the wood is burnt on open fire. So again, that's why we had this conversation two weeks ago with the, with the Mayor of London's office and really, you know, they're accepting that the problem there in smoke control areas really is, is the inability to control uh, how, how to burn the wood. Briefly, David Duffy. There are restrictions within smoke control areas in terms of development and that within a smoke control area, you have to have uh, the defined list of stoves, so it has to have a certain efficiency uh, with a smoke control area. OK, I've got two colleagues looking to ask uh, supplementary questions. Donald Cameron and then Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Kavina. It's really a follow-up to your question. I'm struggling to hear any concrete evidence as to whether this is a problem in Scotland or, or not, and I think this is essential to, to the debate. Um, and I was going to ask, is there an urban-rural issue here, and particularly seeing as we've got a representative from Glasgow, do you have... For instance, people complaining about um, pollution from stoves, from wood burning, etc. Um, to what extent, in your experience, is it, is it a problem? Just to Vincent McAnally. Um, no, the answer is yes, we do have people complaining. It's, it's, it's more to do with the odours associated with wood burning than, than, than maybe the concern about the pollutants there. Is it a huge problem or a, a large number of complaints? No, it's not. Um, um, but that's maybe perhaps due to the number of installations that have been put in place. I mean, a couple of things I could pick up on, you know, open fires, we don't have open fires mm -hmm. in Glasgow, it's a smoke control area right across mm -hmm. Glasgow, so it has to be an approved appliance that you're, you're burning it in. Um, I mean, my own thoughts on it are, you know, the Clean Air Acts, when they were introduced in the 50s, 60s, were probably the most significant pieces of public health legislation introduced in the UK. Um, and because they allowed local authorities to prohibit the burning of solid fuels within their areas um, and move back towards burning of wood, uh, burning of solid uh, fuels uh, is, a, is a backward step, I think, in areas where we have concerns over air quality. Now, it's not, it's not, there's no evidence of it being a huge problem at the moment, but I think it's something we need to keep a, a watchful eye on to see whether it becomes, continues to become more popular or trendy to have wood burning stoves in your house place. Um, another issue with it is, you know, they, they can be laboratory tested to show that they're, they're very clean and how they're run when they're run exactly as they're supposed to be operated. But we have no control over what people put in the fireplace on a dark night in a tenement where nobody can see what's going into it. And there is a, you know, a natural human tendency to think, oh, just chuck it in. Uh, and and then, then what are the emissions like that, that come out from that? So there are, there are concerns, but there's no, we as a local authority don't have an evidence base to show that it's impacted on levels of pollution at the so, so just to come back on that, if you were, and this is an unfair question, but if you were to try and apportion uh, the percentage of uh, emissions or pollution that you get from stoves in, in Glasgow, would you be able to put a percentage figure on it? No, and it would vary from, from street to street, right. from area to area, but okay. no, I couldn't give a figure. Okay, thank you. And one final question in this section, Claudia Beamish. Right, thank you, Convener, and good morning to you all. Um, it's a question for uh, Dennis Milligan. If you could just highlight for us, uh, for the record, um, in your written evidence, you highlighted the issue about uh, an incentive scheme to encourage the replacement of um, open fires and older stoves with, uh, as you term it, an eco-design-ready um, stove. Um, and is there a tension or a conflict with the renewable heat incentive on that? So if you could just briefly um, uh, explore that with us. Well, wood burning stoves aren't part of the of RHI, so really they they um, B has found it difficult because because it's it's a manual uh, batch fed stove, it's it's hard to fit into into into, into their model. So there, there's no incentive there for for people to to put in a wood burning stove. Uh, the 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 view we have is, is really to say that um, technology has moved on so much in the last ten years and continues to move on that really we felt it was important to to try and bring the existing stock up to date. And so we, ha we have been in discussions with DEFRA on trying to bring in a, an upgrade scheme. Uh, as yet, those discussions are still go ongoing. Um, again, just to fill you in, that, that when we again spoke to the, the Mayor of London's office about, it, about the scheme, they, they got very excited because really they're, they're recognising that within London, even though they have the Clean Air Act, uh, say 70% of the wood burnt in London is actually coming from open fire. So although the Clean Air Act uh, and smokeless zones are not meant to burn wood except in, a, in an exempted appliance. Really, a lot of people are, are just burning wood on, on open fires. And so, really, 
the idea of the uh, upgrade scheme is trying to encourage people to move forward because really enforcement seems to be a difficult thing to do in, in terms of wood burning. All right, that's helpful, thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's move this on. Uh, Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Um, tomorrow is World COPD Day, and uh, which is interesting that we've got a debate tonight, actually, and I think some of the members will be speaking on it, about COPD and raising awareness. So the poorer air quality evidence is that it exacerbates existing lung conditions, especially in vulnerable people. So I think it's important to highlight that, and actually it's interesting we're having this air quality discussion round about World COPD Day. So I'm interested to hear about how does Scotland compare to other European cities, especially European cities that have um, their leading in active travel. And, uh, you know, is the cleaner air for Scotland's vision of Scotland's air quality being equivalent or the best in Europe? Is that feasible for us? Scott Hamilton. Um, so I, I think uh, the, uh, the, the, the air quality story in Scotland is um, very good, actually, in most cases. Um, we have some quite isolated uh, problems with air pollution, but generally um, the country benefits from being surrounded by ocean on three sides. We don't have uh, very many large polluting neighbours. Um, so as, as uh, for instance, so the, the European Environment Agency, they, they publish each year um, Europe-wide uh, statistics and comparisons between uh, regions, and Scotland always comes out very favourably in that compared with other European countries. The outlier in that is uh, NO2. Um, we have a, a very, very low particle climate compared to other countries. I've, I've done a lot of work in China just very recently. Um, they have quite low concentrations of NO2 compared to PM. We are, we are, we are the opposite. We have a lot of NO2 and not very much PM. Um, so that points to uh, the UK has a very sort of sp specific issue with using a lot of diesel. Um, and that the, the manifestation of that is a lot of NO2 in the atmosphere. Um, but, but if you were to take the, the, the Scotland in the round, um, Scotland comes up very favourably in comparison with other European countries. And uh, typically, any exceedances that we have of standards are very marginal, um, obviously with some cases like Hope Street that like we, we mentioned that are very, very specifically hot spots and uh, almost a, an engineering problem as much as anything. But yeah, Scotland has good air quality compared to other countries, other uh, parts of the world. Very good air quality. Angus MacDonald. Thanks, um, Convener. Just picking up on the, the, the issue of, of hot spots, um, I represent Grangemouth. Um, which it's fair to say has had a number of uh, challenges with regard to uh, air quality in the past, and there have been a number of breaches, exceedances of uh, SO2 um, in my constituency, which has resulted in an AQMA specifically for SO2. Um, and to the extent that any of us have uh, invested um, just over £70 million in a sulphur recovery unit uh, at the refinery, um, now, clearly, uh, removal of sulphur from fuel is uh, as close to source as possible is a good thing. And as I understand it, um, the UK exceedance levels uh, are, are higher or more stringent than uh, the EU levels. Uh, and any of us have often claimed to me that their, their breaches were against UK levels rather than EU levels. Um, so c could you explain to the committee the, the, the difference between the EU exceedance levels and, and the UK oblique Scottish ones um, and how they managed to um, fit in with, uh, with monitoring? Um, so so the, um, the, the UK domestic um, standards for, for SO2, I, I'm not really an industrial modeler per se, so I don't do much work on SO2, but the standards are more stringent and that one of the objectives that are, is used in the UK doesn't exist in European legislation. Um, I, um, I think it's a 15-minute standard um, is, is way more stringent in the UK than um, uh, Europe. The reason for that being, obviously, that SO2, um, it's... Uh, uh, it's a very, it has a very acute action on human health, whereas NO2 is more of a chronic uh, uh, contributor to health deterioration. Um, I can't comment on what, what the rationale was behind adopting a more stringent uh, standard, but yes, it is more stringent and, uh, than Europe. Okay. Mark Sutton, do you want to come in on that? It was just a, a quick comment on the particulate matter and the relative 
uh, clean atmosphere of Scotland compared to some other regions in the world. I think just to reflect on that, yes, we're I guess, very happy we don't have the air pollution of Delhi, um, but I would say that's not a, a reason for complacency um, and perhaps to make the distinction between meeting a target value and having no air pollution effects at all, because the target values, of course, are an outcome of a, a set of complex negotiations of how much are we ready to agree to go for. Uh, but as far as I understand from the effects scientists, they are saying we don't have a threshold for human health impacts of particulate matter. All particles are bad. So even if your, your particle limit is, is so many micrograms per meter cubed, if you're a little bit less than that, that doesn't mean you have no impact. It, there are still impacts. And of course, the other thing with Scotland is, and we've seen this in the air monitoring data and the modeling, is occasionally we do get big uh, high levels of pollution coming in from across continental Europe. Um, and this raises the point that it's a combination of what happens in our city, of our local sources, but also managing our widespread sources across the countryside, across Europe, because the background levels, even before they enter the city, can be very high. Yeah, on, on the subject of cities, um, is there any kind of um, league table, for want of a better expression, about cities, similar cities to Glasgow and Edinburgh across Europe and how they are performing? And if there is, and there are cities doing better than ours, what are they doing differently? Vince McNally. I thought that might come to me. Um, <laughs> it, clearly, there was a, an article in a, a couple of the newspapers um, and over the past three weeks that was suggesting that Glasgow was the worst in the UK for for air, air quality, and um, which kind of came as news to me, someone working in air quality, and I would imagine to most people that have ever ventured further than Glasgow uh, and gone to places like uh, London and, and Birmingham, where the air quality there is clearly uh, much more of a problem than it is within our city. Um, league tables probably uh, aren't able to be used to reflect the, the differences in air quality because of, it's not then necessarily looking at the, the number of people that are exposed to it, the, the areas that the pollution levels are confined to. For example, Hope Street, it fails the, the, the objective for the, uh, for the annual mean. However, there's no residential properties within it. So yeah, the, the, the levels there are higher, but people don't live in that area. So it's not as bad as maybe um, a, a exceedance of a, an, an objective in an area where there are a large number of people living or even schools located within it. So there, there's no real league table as such. Um, but I mean, I would echo the comments that have been said previously, the air quality within Scotland is generally really good, and including within Glasgow. Um, you know, particulates being identified as the most harmful component of air pollution, well, we meet the Scottish and WHO objectives for both PM10 and PM2.5, um, which is, again, that article inaccurately reported on data from 2013. Um, pollution has dropped in relation to particulates right across Scotland, but in Glasgow as well, uh, and all of the objectives are being met. OK, Scott Hamilton and then Mark Ruskell wants to come in. Uh, I just uh, wanted to make the observation, just really a, a note of caution, I suppose, about interpretation of uh, league tables. I mean, the WHO publish uh, a, a league uh, every year. They, as I say, the European Environment Agency publish a league every year. Um, the, the individual cities are really... Um, the, the concentrations that are reported in these league tables are very, very sensitive to where the analyzer is placed that is reporting the measurements. So if Glasgow was being interpreted as... Uh, or as Hope Street was like representative of the city, just isn't true, but it is in the league tables. Um, so there is an unfair distinction, I think, uh, to be made when... The sites are not cited exactly under the same conditions, which they are. are they are not. There's no way they are across all of Europe. So. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Mark Roscoe. Yeah. I mean, it, it's obviously difficult to, if you're going to start comparing and adding in league tables and trying to assess what the impacts are of individual streets on individual people. I mean, I, I used to work for Hope. Uh, I used to work uh, in an office in Hope Street. So I used to spend about nine hours a, a day there. So I might, maybe I've had, you know, greater greater impact in terms of air quality on on my health than somebody who's just walking past the area. Uh, and I think this debate comes back to health. So, I mean, when you're looking at air quality management areas where you're looking at chasing limit values, what what's the health data on that? How many lives do we save if we reduce PM10 or NOx by a certain uh, value over time? What, what kind of 
impact data is there on that? Because at the end of the day, otherwise we're just comparing one city to another or one area mm. to another without any kind of meaningful analysis of what it actually does if we reduce air quality uh, pollution. Scott Hamilton. Um, on, a, on a sort of suburban level, like if it was a, a street or a group of streets within a city, I think the answer to that question is we don't typically make that quantification, although there are methods to do that. Uh, DEFRA publish uh, a series of what are called damage costs. That, uh, but that, that, So that's, for instance, if you emit a tonne of PM10 in a city, the damage cost to society in, in pounds is X. Um, the damage cost is way higher for PM than it is for NOx, but we don't typically ever decompose it down to... Um, a street level. I mean, uh, individual streets is, is. We're talking about an engineering fix that's required. I think some, sometimes rather than a, a sort of broad strategic um, fix. Um, so. mm -hmm. David Duffy. If I could maybe add to that as well, uh, in terms of complementing the way that the air quality management action planning funds are allocated, you have to justify some of that in terms of if you designate a measure to say what the quantifiable improvement is. Also, some of the uh, one of the CAF's statements says that now that the health boards who are looking at health um, have to include air quality as part of their joint health protection plans. So we're, as a nation, including the health boards with the scientists and the local authorities and transport and planners much better than we were arguably historically. So there is an opportunity for Scotland to improve an already excellent uh, air quality. It has some local um, and hotspots. However, as a whole, um, Scotland is looking and has to look at um, joint health partnership plans to consider the impact of uh, the recognised pollutants. So there is work that's at the start just now, and it will see how that develops forward. But just, just to come back on that, I mean, you say Scotland's air quality is excellent, but then there are figures to show that 2,500 people are dying every year because of air quality issues. So... Is that what excellent looks like, or, or is it, no, or is excellent 100 people dying, or 1,000, or you know, it's difficult to get a sense of what, what, what is the goal that we're actually chasing here? What is an acceptable level well, of death from air quality that we can then say, tick, we've done that. That's great. Move on. Same as the other scientists have possibly said, and that they haven't said that there's a target to reach and you will achieve. What well, um, we seem to be on the journey towards improving as a whole, even the title of cleaner air for Scotland doesn't put an end point to it. Mm -hmm. So um, as risks to human health change, um, in the past it was quite apparent that where smogs and pollutants were causing deaths because they were instantaneous. Mm -hmm. This is more chronic conditions that we're struggling from just now. So over the matter of improving air quality and a contribution to improving air quality, we will by default uh, improve the numbers um, of health. What I'm saying in terms of excellent air quality is kind of supported by the other comments in that Scotland as a whole has very good air quality, but we have um, areas where we have to tackle um, is what we get back through our membership and also from all the local authorities. Okay. Um, Emma, do you have further questions? Yeah, it, just a couple of quick ones. I probably should have declared my interest as a registered nurse as well, because I'm asking all these health stuff. Um, uh, this is probably for Vincent McNally. Um, you were talking about how people in Glasgow would get upset if you give them a fixed penalty ticket outside the schools, if they're idling in their cars. Do you think there's adequate resources directed at <coughs> guidance and information for people to understand, you know, why this is really important? You know, is there enough resourcing into it? And my second question would be... Um, what would a low emission zone for Glasgow look like? Uh, has a, anatomically, would it be 20 kilometres? The way Antwerp have launched theirs this February, it's uh, 20 kilometres, city centre, park and ride, you know, photographing licence plates. What would it look like? Um, okay, I'll take the resources one first. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you could always have more resources for... Um, engaging with the public and, and getting a message across. It's a key deliverable within the, um, the CAF's strategy in terms of communications, um, and, and that's to be done across Scotland, clearly. Um, within our own uh, local authority, Glasgow works uh, in cooperation with the neighbouring authorities to run a no-idling campaign every year. Um, the extent of that campaign is limited by the funding that we receive through the 
the grant that we get from the Scottish Government, um, and we're grateful for it. If we had more, we could do more advertising and awareness raising. Um, in the past, we've run television, radio adverts, newspapers, billboards. Um, this year, the funding meant that we were limited to uh, billboards and the back of buses and so on to try and encourage people to switch their engine off uh, and so on. Um, and again, back to the city tree part of that, uh, while it's helping to clean the air or remove pollutants from it, um, the actual structure has information on panels on the side of it um, to encourage the public to visit air quality websites, take, be aware of what they're doing, their contribution to pollution levels. So it's also about raising awareness. There's, there's lots more can be done. I know CEPA have engaged with a lot of schools. Uh, I think that's an excellent idea to try and encourage the kids to, uh, you know, nag their parents into walking them to school. Or I mean, certainly my kids prefer to walk or, or, or use their scooters to go to school. Um, I think there's, there's, there's more can be done. It's just, you know, and the more resources that we have, the more we could do uh, to move on to low emission zones. I mean, that's that's a huge question. Um, what's going to be done? What's it going to look like? Um, it went through our committee at the end of September. I think it was the 29th of September. And there was an agreement in principle to put a low emission zone in in 2018. Um, that will be towards the end of 2018 before that uh, low emission zone is put in place. Uh, the exact details of what it look, looks like will be subject to the delivery group uh, that's been formed, comprising of various parts of uh, Glasgow City Council, the tra transport guys, environment guys, um, the people from equalities, planning, um, legal, procurement. There's a, there's a huge working group being formed with that, but it also includes outside agencies such as Transport Scotland, SEPA uh, and SPT. Uh, in addition, we have a delivery forum being set up specifically to engage with stakeholders. That's the fleet operators, the bus operators, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, anybody else that will be impacted by the low emission zone when it comes into place. Uh, and it's not really for us to just say that is how a low emission zone is going to look at this stage. We need to engage with these stakeholders, get feedback from that and help shape the, the low emission zone so that it will be effective when it comes into place. Having said that, it's quite clear that the low emission zones boundary at the moment that's being considered approximate, uh, is approximately uh, equivalent to the existing city centre air quality management area. Um, that's not to say it'll be exactly that, but it'll be approximately that. And that, if you don't know Glasgow, that's the area that's bounded by the M8 to the west and north, the Clyde to the south, and then it's the Salt Market High Street kind of area to the, to the, to the east. But that's approximately. It's yet to be confirmed exactly where it will be, and that will be subject to further work through the delivery group and delivery forum. Okay. Okay. Speed right into the low emission zones, and, and I want to develop that in a second with uh, David Stewart. Mark Sutton, you had a brief comment to make. Yes, it's a quick response to Mark Ruskell's challenging question. And, and I, I tend to think that as a scientist, uh, we can't tell you how many deaths is acceptable. That's probably back in, in your court. Um, but what I do think is this whole discussion on... Scotland having relatively good air quality, whatever relatively means compared to others, is only one way of looking at it. It's the way of looking at it. it says how much are we affected by air pollution. Of course, our emissions are going up into the air and in the international context, contributing to a higher background in other parts of Europe. So we are all, our, our air emissions are all contributing to air pollution problems, particularly the, the large scale secondary particulate matter in other parts of Europe. So it's not just a question of We've got relatively good air quality, so we don't have a problem. We have a problem because we're contributing to other people's air pollution across Europe as well. OK, thank you. Um, David Stewart, do you want to explore the low emission zones issue now? Right, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, can I focus specifically on low emission zones and can start with Mr McAnally uh, for understandable reasons, but then throw open to the panel uh, as a whole. Um, the first question, Mr McAnally, is will you have the LEZ up and running by next year? Uh, the LEZ will be uh, in place for 2018. Um, that's what's in the committee paper that's been passed at uh, Glasgow City Council. Thank you. I think in May when you gave evidence, you said, and I, and I quote, uh, a pilot of the low motion zone should be dependent on what resources and funding will be available. As yet, we do not have that information. Have you moved on considerably since you made that statement in May? Uh, n not in relation to funding. Um, no, the, the funding is not clear for the low emission zone. That will be expected, I think, in uh, the 14th of December. I think the Scottish Government's budget announcement will be there. So, um, 
we should be clearer then about what resources will be available to it. Um, so I think what I'm saying is there will be a low emission zone in place for 2018. Exactly what it will look like and how ambitious it will be will depend on the resources that are made <coughs> available uh, and it will be subject to you know, further discussions as the delivery group progresses. I mean, one, of, one of the issues you may have picked up, the previous evidence we've taken, is about the use of technology. And as I understand it from London, there's uh, vehicle recognition technology which can detect um, registration numbers and detect if they're Euro 6 or not. Obviously, I understand that you do have that technology for, for bus lanes in Edinburgh. I mean, do you have that technology in place now that would do a 360 degrees round a potential LEZ in central Glasgow? Do we have we have AMPR cameras that are uh, linked to our bus lane enforcement? Yes, we do currently have that. Are they in place now that would allow us to have a low emission zone sufficient for a low emission zone? No, they're not. Right. So, I mean, clearly then that's a budgetary issue. You would need to know what budget's available <coughs> um, in order for you to roll out that technology. And even if you had the budget today, presumably that's a, quite a big technological leap to have it all up and running, even in 12 months' time. Is there, a, is there a chance that we could have an LEZ in name only in Glasgow next year to come into force a couple of years after that? Well, the, the, the low emission zone will be in place for 2018. Uh, the enforcement, I think you're talking about the, when does the enforcement come in? Correct. Well, the enforcement, uh, even once the low emission zone is in place, there will need to be, a, a, if you like, a sunset period for businesses and uh, owners of vehicles to get... Um, to have their vehicles compliant. Mm. Um, I think it's unrealistic to expect that as of 2018, we would be expecting 100% compliance for all buses, mm -hmm. trucks, cars, that are within the low emission zone to, to meet that standard. When you're talking mm -hmm. about such a large area, there has to be a time for the business community and for fleet operators to get their vehicles of a standard mm -hmm. that will be compliant. Mm -hmm. And have you looked at best practice? I mean, there's an argument about this, but certainly my experience in London is that they, they are quite far forward, obviously, with the congestion zones way back in time, the ultra low emission zones bringing and so on. Have you shared experiences with other cities? Because LEZs are not exactly new. Across Europe, we've got LEZs. There's an argument we don't need a pilot at all. But if you looked at best practice and said, well, they made a mistake on that, we wouldn't do that. Or have you looked at what the positives and negatives are with LEZs? Uh, yeah, we have done, and um, we've been doing that in Glasgow for, for, for quite a while. Uh, and one of the things that become apparent is that because we have a problem with NO2 and not PM10, that the emission standard that we require is Euro 6 uh, and, uh, for diesel vehicles, uh, whether it's heavy duty v uh, Euro 6 or Euro 6 for passenger cars uh, and Euro 4 for petrol. Uh, and that's a very demanding standard. That's much higher mm -hmm. than has been asked for anywhere in, in, in the rest of Europe. And it's equivalent to what has been asked for uh, in the London ultra-low emission mm -hmm. zone. So the, the current emission, uh, low emission zone in London does not ask for uh, emission standards as high as what we will be asking for in Glasgow. The ultra-low emission zone will be, will be similar mm -hmm. to that. The means by which it would be in place would be automatic number plate cameras. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, that's, and that's something to be applauded. I think we should congratulate you for having a high standard. Could, sorry, can we... Clear. What a reasonable sunset period would be? I think it'd be unfair to say at the moment because we have to engage properly with the stakeholders that... Uh, uh, it, the, the idea of the low emission zone being put in is that there has to be proper engagement with all of the uh, stakeholders, and it's not for us just as a local authority to say that you know this date will, will come in without any consultation mm. or engagement. But I mean, two questions that arise from that: ballpark. Are we talking about a couple of years? Are we talking about five years? Are we talking about ten years? And have those conversations started already? Uh, the conversations have started with some of the stakeholders through the engagement process that's been going on through both uh, the CAF strategy and what's been done at a local level by Glasgow City Council. Um, I would think you'd be look, talking about the medium term for some vehicles, such as, I mean, for buses, example, you can retrofit a bus, so you can fit a new exhaust system onto it. If you have a van or a car, you need to replace that vehicle, so there will clearly need to be a longer uh, period for uh, sunset period for owners of those vehicles to make them compliant. Okay, thanks. Sorry, David. Could I just bring you back to the retrofitting that you've predicted my next point? Um, I, I seem to remember you raised before that um, Glasgow had a scheme for an incentive scheme for retrofitting buses. Was I correct on that? Could you uh, tell me? We tried to offer 
grant funding for buses to be retrofitted. We offered 80% of the cost right. of retrofitting a bus. Um, it was funds that were made available from Glasgow City Council, the Scottish Government and SPT, and we had no uptake uh, or interest I'm, from any bus operators. Well, we had interest, but nobody went through with I'm it. extremely surprised about that because, I mean, obviously bus companies, we've had evidence, obviously, know they will have an LEZ, will know they will have Euro 6. They, there's some knowns in this. What, I mean, why are they not taking up this excellent offer? But I should be clear about that. This was a, a few years ago, and this was before a low emission zone was on the cards. Right. So this could be a different context. As one of one of the bits of evidence we've taken, as you will know, is, and this actually came from bus companies, is the worry is that in, once we create LEZs throughout Scotland, is we will have Euro 6 compatible buses in the LEZs. But there will be a trickle-down system where older, more run-down buses, if you like, are in areas out with the LEZ, which obviously we don't want. And there's also wider issues about if companies have to increase um, their charges for buses or lose availability in routes, that you'll find that people will um, no longer be able to have the, the bus choices. But that's uh, an issue for another day. Once the LEZ is announced, will you, is the incentive scheme still up and running? Uh, this will be subject to the funds that are that are going to be made available, I believe, in December. And we do not have a budget for retrofitting buses at the council. Now, that money, um, as I say, was a number of years ago. There was no uptake in it. Yeah. And we ended up uh, buying two fully electric buses for provision within uh, Glasgow. So they run on the 100 service within the city. Um, the, 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 the point about... Um, the grant funding being made available for retrofitting buses. Yes, now there's a low emission zone coming into place. I would think there would be interest in uptake mm -hmm. of the grant funds, uh, and it's you know this funds funding being made available for bus operators is going to be key to yes, delivering a successful low emission zone, right. because the feedback from the bus operators, understandably, is that if they need to spend fifteen thousand pounds to upgrade a bus, over and it's you know several hundred buses needing done, that there will be an inevitable increase in charges and bus fares yeah. and that's the last thing that yeah. I want as an air quality specialist is to see people being put off using public transport and deciding to go back to using yeah. their cars. Yeah. Um, in terms of displacement um, I don't think that will be uh, uh, as much of a concern for a couple of reasons. We're, you know, we're talking about the, the, the older buses that are in the, the, the areas that we're having the, uh, recording the highest levels of pollution being targeted first. So that would seem appropriate that that's where to target the effort. The buses don't need to go anywhere else. They can be retrofitted with a new exhaust system, so you can still have the same bus with that exhaust yep. system running in that place. The benefits from those buses extend beyond uh, the immediate low emission zone within Glasgow, because yeah. the buses run in a, yep. a number of different areas. And the final point on that is that low emission zones are being... Uh, are, 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 are to be expected in a number of cities in Scotland. And that's the good thing about that, that there's no, there would be no point in just displacing them when other cities then come on board and decide that they're going to have a low emission zone. Yeah, thanks. That's very helpful. Could I throw in my, my final questions to all the panel? Um, there's also an argument that LEZ should include private vehicles as well as commercial, and emissions may be looked at as per passenger per, uh, as opposed to per vehicle. Can I ask? The other panel members, including Mr. McAnally, what their views on using private vehicles uh, to be subject to LEZs? Scott Mr. Hamilton. <clears throat> I think it's a very uh, pertinent question, the, the question of uh, private vehicles. Um, much of the reason we're, we're sitting here today is because we're, we have a, a measured problem with air quality in our, in our cities and towns. And, 100% sure that most of that problem is arising from too much diesel in the car fleet in the wrong place at the wrong time and the wrong technology. Um, so although uh, the aims of, of, of the CAF's uh, the strategy are, are very admirable, I mean, there's there's a fundamental problem in how we fuel our private vehicles in the UK right now. And um, to be very blunt about it, no diesel, no problem. Um, we, as I say, have done a lot of work overseas where we they, they have similar concentrations of NO2 to Scotland, but very, 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 very much higher PM10 concentrations, and it's because they don't use diesel. So if we could if we could uh, reverse the dieselisation process from 15 years ago, whatever it was, our air quality problems in our cities go away overnight almost. Right. Thank you. Other panel members. 
Okay, just, but then just on the cars then, yes, I mean, it was within the committee paper that went, was passed at Glasgow that cars will be included in subsequent phases of the low emission zone. Right. So they will be included. And just to completely echo Scott's comments on, on the dieselisation of the fleet, that's the reason that we have the problem that we do at the moment. And there are still, uh, you know, tax incentives to drive mm. uh, diesel cars. The MOT tests that the vehicles go in for doesn't test for NOx emissions. Um, so it, it, there, are, there are big problems with the diesel fleet that are not going to go away overnight. Mm. Okay, thank and you. Uh, could you, you sorry, do you want to say a final point, uh, Kavir? Uh, uh, and it's more an observation than a question. But I think what has not helped confidence has been, Mr McNally made this point in another context, is the difference between um, ideal lab conditions for diesel vehicles and the on-the-road reality. Uh, and there obviously has been companies which have falsified these results, which clearly, I think, has set the confidence. But I note in Scotland that diesel vehicle private car sales have plummeted, and clearly the individual drivers are taking this, this on board. I don't know if the panel have any general points on the difference between lab conditions and real life. Um, the observation I would make about diesel uh, engines is that uh, it, it's the, the manufacturers, the, the subsequent uh, iterations of Euro 6 um, C and D that are due to come in over the next sort of few years, um, it's very, it's quite difficult, a very difficult technological challenge to get to the emission levels that are being promised even in the subsequent iterations of Euro 6. Um, it's, there is some confidence in that the, the, the testing regime has been tightened up to include real world uh, driving conditions, but um, it's a tough, tough ta task, um, and if we get to Euro 6 C and D and we still have an issue, um, we just have to use less diesel. It's not Euro 6 diesel, Euro 5 diesel, it's less diesel, just full stop, because um, a, even a, a, a brand new diesel car is going to emit probably 10, 15 times more NOx than a brand new petrol car. And it, going back to first principles, that solves the issue overnight. Um, mm. Right, thank you. John Scott. A flatty question, but can one retrofit diesel cars? And you talk about retrofitting buses, or is it just not economically viable? Um, it's not economically viable to do that. I mean, the cost of uh, a, a retrofit in a bus is about £15,000 per bus. That's that's the cost of the technology. And then it takes up a lot of space, as you can imagine, in a, a bus's chassis and engine compartments. There's a lot more space to fit that into it. it, it it's just not doable for, for, for cars and for smaller vans. Thank you. OK, thank you. That's good to get that to clarified. Can I um, just move this on a little bit and ask a panel a kind of combined question around whether you would support congestion or other... Uh, direct charging to discover uh, to discourage driving into or within urban areas and also perhaps let's take in the issue about the uptake of electric vehicles and the development of charging infrastructure for example would you be in favor of a requirement for all new build to have to have an electric vehicle charging point within who wants to go first Scott Hamilton. Uh, David Duffy. <laughs> right. Mine, because mine probably won't be as scientific as the other gents are. Uh, yes, we'd support any measure that's going to you know, improve public health. Uh, if congestion charging um, as part of a strategy and that's risk-based to reduce that, then yes. Um, however, we wouldn't see that as the first point because it would have other impacts. Um, on the second part about... Uh, widening the electrical vehicle infrastructure. Um, yeah, more than support um, making that more available to encourage the use of the uh, EV. Um, I think on the first question of uh, congestion char charging, I mean, um, I, I'm not a, a politician or a, a transport engineer, so I can only really speak to the, 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 the environmental benefits. We can think of the city as a big box, essentially. The less emissions we put in that box, the less exposure to high concentrations of pollution we have. Congestion charging would probably reduce the emissions in that box, so therefore um, I would definitely support it. Um, electric uh, vehicles, um, I think in cities like Glasgow, and I, I speak from personal experience, uh, I live on the third floor of a flat, uh, a, a tenement building, and I, c I just can't get an electric vehicle because I can't charge the vehicle. Um, so I think there's a big challenge in somewhere like Glasgow where a lot of the population live high, uh, up high. Um, to even charge a vehicle, I would buy one tomorrow if I could make it work. Uh, so, yeah, any more infrastructure is a good thing. 
Ms. Wayne Alley. Um, yeah, I mean, there is work being done in Glasgow at the moment because, as you can imagine, we do have a lot of tenemental properties and, and putting in that charging network is, is a challenge. But there, there is kind of new innovative work being looking at how we can do that. Um, yeah, within new developments, it's always a, a struggle for us to try and encourage uh, developers to put in uh, uh, charging points because... Um, they maybe don't think there's going to be the demand that, that we we do. You, know, you build it and people may be more likely to, to use it in the future. So, yeah, more charging points, definitely a, a, a good thing. In terms of congestion charging, I mean, I'm just talking purely from a personal point of view because it does become a political issue when you get to congestion. Um, I, th I believe at both national and local government level, there's uh, no desire to see any road user charging being introduced. Um, but... From an air quality point of view, anything that cuts down on congestion will have a positive impact on air quality. Okay. Does anybody else want to come in on this? No? Uh, Mark Roskill? A, a brief follow-up point to um, Dave Stewart's point about um, cars. Um, I mean, how significant are cars as a component of air pollution within our cities? Or is it more about cars' role in terms of creating congestion, which then means that our freight and, and buses are stationary and, and emitting more? Just trying to get a sense of kind of where cars sit within the overall problem that we have and what what contribution they're making to this problem. Um, well, we've got quite a lot of uh, new modelling data that's been provided uh, through part of our work that we're doing, looking at low emission zones, and it varies from street to street. So, in a street like Great Western Road, cars will be contributing seventy percent of the, the the levels of air pollution that we're recording. Um, but then you go to Hope Street. Uh, and it's 70% from buses. Um, so it depends on the, the, the type of traffic uh, and how it's moving uh, in, in that area. Um, but where it becomes interesting is that in Great Western Road, while cars are the main source of pollution, the objective's been met. Um, so it's, 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 it's a mixed picture. And within the city centre, there are some streets where it's half and half cars, half buses. But what's important is, from the car component, it's over 90% diesels that are producing the emissions. It's not the petrol vehicles within that. Uh, and we've got some, some data I'd be happy to send on if the panel would be interested in seeing it, um, which, uh, which quite clearly shows the breakdown of the different types of fleet, whether it's buses, taxis, HGVs, vans, and even within the car component, how much of that's diesel and how much of that's petrol, and it's the diesel cars. So it's diesel cars and buses that are the main issues within Glasgow. Okay, Scott Hamilton, then David Duffy. Um, the, the Scottish local authorities, indeed all UK local authorities, have been looking at this problem since 1997 and have been tasked through the local air quality management legislation to conduct what's called source apportionment. So there'll be, I mean, every local authority in the country that has an AQMA will have gone through the process of apportioning the relative importance of sources to inform local action planning. So there, there's a huge amount of evidence already outside the CAFs uh, scheme, uh, talk to any council, ask them if they have source apportionment data, they probably have got it and it would echo exactly what uh, Vincent uh, said about diesel cars and heavy traffic too so. David Duffy um, Scott just said what I was going to say. Excellent, <laughs> thank you very much uh, Let's move very briefly Mark Roscoe. No, so I was going to move on to another topic but... well, I'll move on to um, Emma Harper in it's just a final question about, um, we haven't uh, talked about Brexit yet, but I'm wondering what the panel would think of any impact uh, Brexit will have on air quality in Scotland. Mark Sutton. So it was, I think, December 2016 that was agreed the revision of the National Emissions Ceilings Directive, which uh, was, of course, a a major negotiation to take forward the previous international commitments of our, our national level uh, for the whole of the UK of emissions and the rest of Europe. Um, so presumably, well, one can ask the question, what would, where would that stand in, in a Brexit world? In, among the things that did, of course, it committed the UK and other countries to further reductions of sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, and ammonia. Um, the ammonia from agriculture, the others from industry and transport, so perhaps those commitments may not be existing in the future. I'm not certain. Uh, the other thing is it did on the agriculture side is it had a specific annex about national action plans on taking action on reducing agricultural ammonia emissions. Um, that, that annex was not in the 1999 one. 
Um, so it was a new commitment, and uh, of course, presumably that may or may not go forward in a post-Brexit world. So we really are in a, we've heard a lot about the city level pollution in this discussion, particularly the nitrogen oxides. And, and yes, the nitrogen oxides, high source from cars, also industry, um, the ammonia contributing to the particulate matter from agriculture is more of that, that high level of background PM that's coming into our cities, meaning we've got even worse levels. Um, and really the European legislation um, together with the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. They have a, an approach, but it's not as strong as the European one. So without that European one, the UK legislation is missing and something else would need to be put into place. Anyone else on Brexit? Scott Hamilton. <clears throat> I think the, the main observation that I would make is um, if, if we can retain control of both the ambient standards that we have right now and retain control of the emission sources, then there's no reason for it to affect us at all. Affect us in the sense that concentrations don't change or continue to improve. If we lose, if we don't have control over either the standards, which tend to come from Europe and then the Scottish Government admirably uh, adopt even more stringent targets, um, if that is lost uh, through the process, then our benchmarks suffer and um, maybe inevitably that results in a deterioration of, of, of air quality. But if we can control both things, the emissions and the, the, the standards, no reason to suspect it may make things worse. But we don't know, I think. Okay, okay thanks. Thank you very much for that. Um, Mark Roscoe. Thank you. Um, can I come back to the issue of air quality management areas? So we've seen a trend in Scotland of increasing designation of AQMAs. Is that a, is that a good or a bad thing? Um, the, I think one of the sort of long-standing, uh, I'm going to use the word problems, I don't know if it's a problem, but um, there, there's no real um, compulsion on local authorities to adopt a consistent approach when declaring AQMAs. Um, one local authority might choose to de declare the whole boundary of their, their entire local authority when actually they've got maybe two or three hotspots, um, whereas some authorities may choose to uh, create an AQMA that's almost like a ribbon that follows the road. Um, I, I don't really know what the pros and cons of both those those, those approaches are. The, um, I, w I wouldn't always um, associate the increase in prevalence of AQMAs with a deterioration in air quality. Um, the, issue, the observation I would make is that these these uh, uh, local authorities, it takes time to investigate all the potential problems in their area, and that's the AQMA development may be a manifestation of sort of getting round to looking at areas through the passage of time. Um, so that, that, that's my observation. It's, it's not necessarily indicative of a, a worsening of overall air quality. Uh, Vince Manganali and David Duffy. Uh, I would just make the point that in Glasgow, we've, of course, revoked our uh, citywide air quality management area. And we are looking, because the air quality targets have been met, and we are now looking to revoke our Parkhead Cross air quality management area if the figures for 2017, when they're completed, uh, show that the, that area continues to meet uh, the objective for NO2, we will revoke that. So we are kind of going in the opposite direction and reducing the number of air quality management areas because of the improving picture in air quality. Uh, I don't really want to comment on other local authorities too much, other than to say that you know there is now more... Uh, and better air quality monitoring equipment that might be assisting local authorities in identifying areas has been a problem that they weren't aware of previously. David. Uh, to echo something that Vincent's saying there and also some of what Scott has said and that um, the knowledge or awareness of how to be looking for these problems possibly wasn't quite as uh, embedded in all the local authority and environment health and various professions. Air quality has also went up the agenda. Uh, the awareness and the wider community is greater. The infrastructure is miles better now than it was before in terms of the monitoring. Um, the, so, Rehas would say that uh, I wouldn't necessarily say that there's worse, but what we've actually done now is we're better informed as to where those sites potentially are. Um, so, identifying the hotspots or the problem areas are better now, whereas we probably weren't aware of them in the past. Um, we've got the scientific backup to be able to say that they're. Uh, partly because of the extension of the monetary site, but also because of the um, experiences of other authorities and um, other professionals um, looking at them. So in those examples where an air quality management area has been revoked, 
what's been the package of investment or measures that have been put in place and are councils adequately funded um, in order to achieve that? Um, well, I mean, more funding always um, finds a way to be uh, invested in, in you know, improving air quality. Um, I mean, I think it has to be noted that generally across Scotland, levels of pollution have been reducing. Um, vehicles, while, while there is still an issue with diesel vehicles, they, they are cleaner now than they used to be. Um, uh, there certain areas have less vehicle use than, than there was before, more public transport use, more people cycling, walking. Um, and, you know, there's a broad range of measures that have been introduced through our air quality action plan that we'd like to think have contributed to the reduction in pollution that has allowed us to uh, revoke these air quality management areas. Um, the, more, the more investment that's put in sustainable uh, and public transport, though, the, the better, we'll, you know, better we'll see the air quality pollution levels reduce. Okay. Something, something. Uh, Mark Sutton. Yes, just a, a quick one, not to forget what's called the Industrial Emissions Directive, um, previously known as the Integrated Pollution Prevention and Control Directive, which deals with large installations um, that goes from anything industry-like and even includes uh, very large pig and poultry farms. Um, that, uh, the implications of that Industrial Emissions Directive is very busily looked after by SEPA, and I'm not aware of any national legislation that is currently in existence to do the same job. Um, if I could move on, I think, um, Mark Sutton, you mentioned in your evidence that there's a need for a step change in the level of communications uh, about air quality. Um, can, you, can you expand on that, what, what you think that, that actually entails? That particular evidence was given by my colleague, Stefan Rice, so I'm now trying to think what you're reading into his text. Okay. Um, in terms of public communication, perhaps, and around how stakeholders are involved in, in, uh, in tackling air quality issues, or being perhaps more aware of them. Yeah, I, I think perhaps one of the points he was making was the need to communicate across boundaries. Um, one of the things we haven't heard of yet much about is the ecosystem impacts of air pollution. We've talked a lot about human health impacts. Um, in his evidence, he drew in the impact, for example, of tropospheric ozone pollution, which is so the nitrogen oxides come out of the cars in the industry, goes together with volatile organic compounds. Ozone is produced in the air we breathe. That's leading to about a 5% loss of yield in many of the crops across the UK. Um, so it's got agricultural consequences. So, that's something that, for example, isn't strongly in the, in the current narrative, which is very much just dominated by human health effects of people in cities. And I think in that he was drawing attention to the fact that there are multiple other benefits we should be thinking of. Of course, the impacts also on semi-natural ecosystems. So uh, Scottish natural heritage is charged with protecting uh, nature reserves of Cost Scotland, um, currently designated as special areas of conservation or triple SIs, those will, many of those will be being impacted by the same air pollution that is affecting human health. Mm -hmm. So we've got crops, nature, and ecosystems. I think perhaps he was uh, wanting to encourage towards a sort of a holistic health, ecosystem health perspective that joins these all together, and there's a higher level of awareness needed of those connections. Yeah, um, I understand that point. I think there was another point made, though, also about health services, educational institutes, whether we have the right public information available uh, within our cities and towns about air quality. So I don't know if anybody wants to, to comment on that in terms of what, what a step change in terms of communications might look like, particularly as we move to roll out local uh, low emission zones. I mean, I, th I think the observation that I would make, and again, I'm not a communications uh, specialist, but I think a lot of the successes that we're seeing right now are around education um, and schools, and uh, maybe perhaps if uh, uh, pollution was a, a, a large uh, component of uh, school curriculums. Um, but I mean, the the, the trouble with um, like like a very direct method of communi communication of say air quality conditions in a city right now is that the measurements that are leading to that are subject to some uncertainty and we you know not not massive uncertainty but certainly some some uncertainty so it's it's actually very technically difficult to give a reliable picture of the air quality conditions in a street at any given uh, moment um, so. 
what about public advice? Um, I mean, if there was potential for a public advice scheme to not buy diesel cars, that would be a fantastic start. Um, and uh, the, um, I keep coming back to this point about diesel, but it is, it's, the, it's the elephant in the room, unfortunately. And, um, so the, the, the trouble with, um, I think, maybe um, advice, uh, uh, depending on how that's framed, a, a lot of the problems that are arising from vehicles are not the fault of the person that bought the vehicle. They're the fault of an engine that's not doing what it's supposed to do in the real world. So, um, and that, that goes all, that cuts across enforcement and education. You know, you, you get an enforcement notice for a car that you thought was clean. You know, uh, what, what do you do then? I mean, it's a very difficult uh, challenge, but... Um, but the, the nub of this, doesn't it? It's a trust issue. Uh, and I should declare interest. I am a diesel driver. I, I bought one because I was told it was better for the environment, and many of us did. So I guess it's the almost the same people coming back and telling a, a different story. And, and you can understand why perhaps the public, some of the public, would be very sceptical about that absolutely essential advice that we need to give them. Yeah. Um, I mean, the... the I, th I think the, 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 the sort of dieselisation obviously was uh, a result of a, a drive to reduce uh, carbon emissions, and mm. it is demonstrably less uh, carbon intensive, but it is demonstra demonstrably more toxic pollutant uh, intensive. So I guess that's a question for the policymakers, which is <laughs> because they conflict, no doubt they conflict, um, mm. but, uh, but it is what it is. Okay. Okay. Uh, Richard Lyle, do you want to come in on that yes. point? We've just discovered the silver bullet. Let's all bring in a law to stop uh, people buying diesel diesel cars and go back to uh, um, basically petrol, which again, a number of years ago, was lead. Um, people moved off of that. Now, declare I'm, I'm a diesel driver also. Um, but basically, if you've not discovered, let, let's just go back to petrol cars and we'll do away with all this pollution. But affect the carbon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If if the if there was uh, uh, into the realms of fantasy, but if there was no such thing as diesel cars, we would have no compliance issues with probably NO2 at, at all. We don't really have compliance issues with PM10 anymore. But um, yeah, overnight it would be a similar uh, picture to lead. Lead overnight, we took lead out of fuel. Ambient concentrations of lead dropped instantly. The same thing would happen with. Re, uh, removal of diesel from the, the private car fleet. And not just the private car fleet, uh, lo, uh, light goods vehicles also. Absolutely. Vin every Vince vehicle. McNally. Sorry? Vince every McNally. vehicle. Ev every vehicle Change that... it back to, to, to petrol. Well, ev every vehicle that is a uh, viable technology, I don't believe it's viable for heavy goods vehicles or buses, but certainly for light goods vehicles and cars, it is certainly viable. Vince McNally. Yeah, I just, I mean, that's the, that's the point. Um, f not for buses, not for heavy goods vehicles, but I mean, they can be Euro 6, of a, a Euro 6 engine that does work in the real world. Um, yeah, if we move to cars, there would be a sig uh, move to cars being petrol uh, or electric, even better, there'd be a, a significant reductions in the levels of pollution. In terms of carbon, I mean, the new. Uh, these new one-litre turbocharged petrol engines that, that, that you can buy now are very efficient. They deliver huge miles per gallon, um, and there, there definitely is a, 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 an argument to say that people should be switching to them if they're doing higher mileages. I mean, the whole thing about diesel as well and being better in terms of carbon reduction, the evidence tends to show that people that buy diesel cars then drive more miles in them because they can get better miles per gallon. They buy heavier four-wheel drive vehicles that are less efficient. Uh, and I, I mean, I don't want to get into the realms of conspiracies or, or how big industry works, but you can sell more profitable, expensive vehicles by putting diesel engines in them, because otherwise the, the fuel consumption is eye-watering to, to be putting petrol engines in those. And, and, and I know there's lots of people around this table that bought diesel cars for the, the right environmental reasons, but there are a lot of people that bought them purely for economic reasons because they were thinking in their own financial self-interest, and that has to be addressed if we're going to get people to move away from diesel vehicles. Absolutely. Uh, Claudia Bemis, then John Scott. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, we've, we've touched on resources and uh, the importance of funding for all these projects. Could I ask um, uh, the relevant members of the panel who want to comment about uh, the development of skills and whether there are the appropriate and um, necessary skills in both local authorities and public bodies more widely. 
um, to address the issues that we're talking about today? And if not, how can that be um, best developed? David Duffy. If, if, in terms of the rehab position, we can only really speak about environmental health officers and folk who are related to the environmental health profession. And there has been a reduction in numbers of these coming through. Um, there have been discussions already with um, MSPs in connection with that about how we could potentially tackle that in future. REAS has attempted to adapt to the situation to bring forward the environmental health professionals that um, historically have led in the air quality management area fields, um, but they also work across other specialisms. Um, so there, there are discussions ongoing, but we do recognise that there is a problem with those professionals coming through. Um, we could say that local authorities are employing fewer, so to, uh, we're all subject to those financial impacts um, within any of the um, local authorities or other enforcement agencies. Um, but we've tried to work round about it so that we can have a route to provide professionals who could work within this area. Um, but it's only one aspect of a wider profession. Um, we're, Environment health officers don't exclusively deal, or technical officers don't exclusively deal with um, air quality. There's food, health and safety, noise and other subjects as well. So there are talks ongoing about how we can try to encourage that and REHIS would be welcome to uh, help more professionals uh, come forward. Any other quick comments on that? On Mark the yes, To think about skills with farmers, because farmers are losing nitrogen from their farm. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, it's going up into the air, it's contributing to greenhouse gases, it's contributing to air pollution, it's contributing to water pollution. As the air pollution part, I think the, the dominant issue is the ammonia still. Uh, there have been concerns also raised about nitrogen oxides coming out of soils. That's the same stuff that's coming out of exhausts. And that's a small fraction historically compared with the car exhausts and the factories. But if we make progress with those sources, and the nitrogen oxides coming out of farming isn't addressed, it will become an increasing share. And we've estimated that up to 10 to 20 percent of nitrogen oxides by 2030 in Europe could be coming from farming soils. So I think this points to also education for farmers, many of whom, of course, are educated in how to make their business run, um, but not necessarily educated in the nuances of how to reduce air pollution. So I think there's a case for better information on the technologies that might help them reduce air pollution and might help them save some money at the same time and give them the confidence where they might need to invest in equipment that that equipment will give them a payoff in due course. Uh, John Scott, then Scott Hamilton. Well, just declaring an interest as a farmer I've, with a vested interest in that regard, but uh, it, farmers are always interested in ways of saving money given the current viability of, of food production in this country. But... So you might want to develop that point and the potential for, for saving money in, in that regard. The question I specifically was going to ask earlier before this one kind of hijacked my thinking was agriculture, food production in terms of agricultural machi machinery, tractors, um, self-propelled vehicles. Um, these would probably still have to remain as diesels, would they? Or is there a, a new developmental phase there for agricultural machinery? In terms I, of I, I don't think I have the competence to ask that question, but I, I can imagine if we can get all sorts of vehicles with electric in the future, maybe we can with some agricultural vehicles as well. The question will come down to the, the power requirements for a particular task. What is clear is I think um, that precision agriculture is offering great potential. Um, of course, if we make better savings with less emission and, and less emission from fertilizers, less emission from manures, that means... Uh, more precise and less input of mineral fertilizers. Uh, of course, how much power you need to get a fertilizer application across is going to be very different from how much you need for plowing your field. So you may end up in a world where you're actually going to need two pieces of kit, one which might be still a diesel for doing some really heavy work, and maybe then some uh, lighter piece of kit might potentially be electric in the future. Uh, Vincent McNally. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think... Uh, I don't think uh, there's going to be a replacement for diesel tractors anytime soon. Um, but 
you know, that's not the issue. They're operating in areas where we don't have air quality concerns. It's the vehicles that are within our built-up urban environments that are causing air quality issues. Um, in terms of the previous question to do with the, the, the skill set, um, uh, I would just add that you know the Scottish Government have provided training courses for local authority officers to go on, particularly in relation to uh, local air quality management uh, and, and air quality assessments and so on. So th they have been invest in, in some of that. Uh, the other thing is that um, there is a sharing of resources between uh, the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency with uh, like cities like Glasgow, Dundee, Aberdeen uh, and Edinburgh uh, to, to, to forward the, the, the low emission zones. And that has, uh, that has been great for us as a local authority to get that kind of level of engagement with the senior scientists within, within CEPA. Okay, Scott Hamilton. So, uh, I just wanted to make a quick point going back to the question about um, education. Um, I, I think the observation that I would make, um, I have a, a strong involvement with a university in Glasgow. I'm a uh, supervised PhD student uh, through a link there. and um, The observation that I would make is that um, atmospheric science and by extension air quality is a fantastically complex field. And I think what what Scotland lacks at the moment is uh, university education programmes in atmospheric science, combustion science, first principles science uh, with specific relevance to, to air quality. Um, and that's the observation that I would make. It's, I, I couldn't right now go and do a master's in atmospheric science in Scotland. I would have to leave. So that's okay. Mark Sutton. Caveat to Vincent McNally's comment just now about emissions in rural areas. Um, and, if, and I think it's very important that we distinguish the different pollutants and the different impacts in this. So if it's a question of direct emission from an exhaust pipe contributing to NO2 or particulate matter, if that's the case and the tractor's out in the field away from people, less impact, fine. Uh, but if it's a question of, of the nitrogen oxides coming out of the bat of that tractor contributing to secondary particulate matter uh, and all the other emissions that are occurring in the rural environment contributing to secondary particulate matter, those rural emissions then blow into the city and give you a much higher baseline air pollution onto which the local sources then add. So, so I think it would be wrong to say that any emission in a rural environment is not contributing to urban air, air pollution threats, uh, but we need to distinguish between the primary and the secondary pollution issues. Thank you for that. Uh, Richard Lyle. Uh, Gentlemen, can I pick up on a comment that Vincent McNally made earlier and, and, and during the process? Uh, we have been told that in oral evidence that there are only 95 air quality monitors across Scotland, but uh, Vincent, you said that um, you have over 100 in Glasgow. I take it these are separate types of monitors? Um, well, uh, we've got over 100 monitoring locations within Glasgow, that's right. Um, I think 12 of them are fully automatic uh, monitoring stations, so they're all linked to um, the, the internet and the, the link to the Scottish Air Quality website, so you can go in and pull off live data from them. Um, and they give us fantastic minute-by-minute -minute data on what levels of pollution are like in that specific area, but there's only 12 of them. Yeah. So we supplement them with uh, a network of diffusion tubes which are an accepted way of measuring the annual mean for NO2. Um, and there's approximately 100 of them at various locations in Glasgow. And we con constantly monitor where they are um, to see whether or not they need to be moved to a, a better location, whether we've had years' worth of data where it's shown that the levels of pollution there are particularly low, we could, we could relocate them somewhere more appropriate. And that's all included within our annual progress report and within our reporting to the uh, Scottish Government <coughs> about the levels of air quality that we have within the city. Right, can I ask the panel, do you think that Existing monitoring stations are in the right places and collect the right data to provide a, a broad picture of air quality across Scotland. Should we have more monitors like, uh, I'm very pleased that you do have that, those in Glasgow and, and have a, a broader coverage of the right across Scotland? Um, I think if the observation I could make, um, as, a, as an air quality scientist, um, I would much prefer to work with measurements from uh, an automatic station that's subject to European standards of quality assurance and quality control 
um, the measurements are much, much, much more reliable and they offer temporal information across the day that you don't get from uh, passive measurement techniques like uh, Vincent mentioned. Um, we, I think we rely far too much in the UK, not just in Scotland, but we rely too much in the UK on passive long-term averages of, uh, from, uh, from what's diffusion tubes, as uh, Vincent mentioned. The uncertainty in each one of those measurements is about plus or minus 20%, best case. Now, when you have an exceedance of two micrograms, which is less than 5% of an exceedance against the standard, uncertainty in a measurement of 20%, plus or minus, my view, not good enough. But that is what is set out in the UK and Scottish Government's technical guidance as being an appropriate way to measure NO2. Undoubtedly, we should have more automatic stations, I, I think. Anyone else on that? Anybody else? OK. Mr Lyle, any further right. questions? Uh, <clears throat> the other point, I think, was agreed earlier, education, uh, educating the public about uh, air quality or educating people, drivers, etc., so should we have more visible air quality information next to monitoring systems? You know how you, you have, oh, slow down, only do 30, you're, you're going too fast in a, a, a panel. Should we not have uh, in a panel, if I'm walking by an air quality uh, monitoring station, oh, that's uh, a, a certain level percentage. Should I not be able to see that rather than have to plug in somewhere and, 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 and download it? Should I not be able to see it as I walk by? Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's something that we looked into before. Um, you know, they've got the Internet of Things. Why, why not make the information available to people? Um, there's, there's a couple of issues with that. First of all, the minute-by-minute -minute data uh, is unratified. It needs to be... Um, it needs to go through the system before we can report on it with any degree of confidence. Um, the, the other thing is that the you, know, you need to put the equipment on these stations, which would need to be new, need to be to be maintained, and, and there'd obviously be a cost to that. Um, but the information is already available. Most people have smartphones; they can easily connect to the Scottish Air Quality website. Any monitor station they're at, you can just drill down into it, into the, the the area that you're in, look at the nearest monitor station, pull up the data that's available to you from that. You can also set it up with the with the uh, Scottish Air Quality website to get emails as often as you like. Because I'm sad, I get one at eight o'clock every morning. It tells me what the monitoring uh, data has been at every automatic monitoring station within Glasgow of the previous uh, 24 hours. It also gives you a prediction, a forecast for what the pollution levels are likely to be that day. If you have uh, health concerns, you can register with the Scottish Air Quality's Know and Respond uh, website, which I think sends you texts. Mm -hmm. If you have underlying health conditions, that will tell you if you're likely to experience um, um, levels of pollution where you could you know, avoid it by either staying indoors or, 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 or even just cut down on any strenuous activity. But we're very fortunate that the levels of pollution that we experience in Scotland are generally low all year round. We don't really have many episodes where uh, pollution levels are high. So the, the data is there. People can access it. Um, there probably are ways that could be done better. I mean, we certainly looked at in the past putting these QR badges on the side of stations where, you, you know, you your phone takes a picture and automatically lets you just to make it a bit easier. It's not that's not been followed through on. Um, but in terms of engaging with the public, there probably are areas that we could look to 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 make it simpler for them to find out what the data is within their area. So would you agree that a level of detail in the Clean Air for Scotland CAF's annual report is adequate to scrutinise progress and, and what we're doing? I think so. I think the, the CAFs has been a um, really positive uh, development in terms of air quality uh, work that's that's getting done within Scotland uh, and you know if people want to read the information that's in it it'll, it'll give them a good update on what's happening right across the uh, uh, Scotland Carson uh, thanks convener my, my question is on the back of um, the, the number of monitors as well but also the use of, of data um, there's always an argument we could have lots more monitors of certain types, but do we not have the information and data available um, from MOTs, uh, car specs, on what their emissions are likely to be at different speeds? We've got uh, weather reports telling us what the, the condensation levels are going to be, the humidity, the wind direction, whatever. Um, we've got monitors on the road that looks at car speeds, vehicle lengths, and whatever. 
Um, and, and also the, the, the increased use of automatic number plate recognition software. So we know what vehicles are, are moving down Hope Street or, or up whatever street. Is there not um, scope for using more modelling to actually provide uh, real-time estimates of what air pollution is? And is that not the way forward? And a supplementary to that is, you know, we're looking at uh, low emission zones. How much joined up thinking is, is there around the digital cities where, uh, again, number plate recognition uh, can be used for uh, traffic management uh, and, and billing or parking or whatever. Is there any joined up approach to using big data uh, for everybody's benefit? And, and if so, who should be leading that? Scott Hamilton. I mean, I think the observation I would make about, um, I think so if I could summarize your first question is, is, is there enough data? Um, Undoubtedly, there's enough data right now for us that we, we know the problem, we know where the problems are, we just don't seem to be able to fix them. Um, so although the, there is an attraction in having more measurements, it's not going to tell us any different answer, uh, sorry, it's not going to delineate the problem any better than it has already delineated. Um, more measurement stations would help with um, public engagement maybe and um, maybe del uh, delimiting the scope of problems perhaps, but I think we already know the problems and you know uh, we should just get to work to try to, try to fix them. Um, the, what was the second point? Sorry, I've lost my... Um. Uh, the, the second point was regarding everybody getting together because there's lots of data out there compiling it to... to to bring forward, you know, our, our, we're talking about our digital cities where the data is all there. Um, is that being done? You know, we've got lots of different sectors. If, if it's not being done, who should be leading it? Um, so, I mean, the observation I would make around that is that uh, it's, it's actually reasonably straightforward to produce real-time models of pollution in, in cities. That's certainly something that the organisation I work for, we do it more overseas than, than here, uh, admittedly, but there, um, there's no reason why that couldn't be a, a, adopted in, in Scotland. Um, we, we, we all, um, there, there already is an air quality forecast in the UK that's uh, previously, uh, my company used to run that programme on behalf of DEFRA and the Scottish Government, but that's now that's the Met Office. So each day you, do, you can get a forecast of air pollution. It's at very low resolution, so you have the same prediction in Glasgow as Hamilton or something like that, but you know the, the technology exists, it's just a matter of application. Certainly. Two points, and the first one I should declare an interest, which is about rural monitoring, because uh, we uh, at CEH runs the only intensive rural air pollution monitoring site in Scotland, and in fact Ricardo AA uh, paired in a network we work together, they run the single site in, in England, and um, which is down at Harwell. Um, compared with the amount of monitoring that's done in the urban environment, that's relatively modest. And I would, uh, I would like to be able to have off the top of my tongue, what is the percentage of urban particulate matter that comes from rural sources advected in? And I can't remember it. I, is it 60%, 70%? Um, a substantial fraction. So knowing how much is coming in from the rural environment into urban environment tells you how much you should be concentrating on your rural sources as well as your urban sources. So I think that really is an important information source and we're very happy that those two sites exist already, one in Scotland, one in... O yeah. Sorry, Mr Scott. Yeah, can I just ask you in that point, in, since you're talking about baseline figures, I mean, how much pollution comes in the air as it comes across the Atlantic, taking the prevailing wind as being southwest? So you talk about baseline figures going from agriculture from the rural areas into the city, but how much baseline pollution is there in the wind in the air as it comes across the Atlantic? It, so it depends on the pollutant form. If you're talking um, ammonia, uh, it's got a short lifetime. Nitrogen oxide's got a longer lifetime, and the particulate matter has got a long lifetime. But those lifetimes mean you get typical, typical transport distances up to a, a thousand or two kilometers. That means we have substantial air pollution transport within Europe, but broadly speaking, the, the air pollution from North America has been washed out before it gets to us. Um, so not too much problem from North America, but substantial problem when the wind's in the right direction from Europe. And, and just to come to my second point um, in response, which was on public communication, where I have no interest, well, other than being a citizen. And I was very interested when I uh, come into Delhi in India, um, and on the side of the road is a big billboard telling me my air quality in lights. And I sit there in my 
transport vehicle, taxi or whatever I'm going in, and thinking, that's rather interesting that Delhi has this up on a big billboard at several places. They have a, a SAFAR system, S-A-F-A-R, if you want to go online to see that. To me, it's, it's an interesting thing in raising people's awareness, and I suspect they probably get rather more visits to their websites as a result of having something like that. Absolutely. Scott Hamilton, briefly, Vince. Um, I, I just wanted to make a point about the, the question about the, the wind direction. Um, we, we're very lucky where we are. Um, we benefit most of the time from very clean Atlantic air. Clean in the sense of it doesn't have a lot of NOx in it, it doesn't have a lot of particles in it. And the particles that are in it is from typically from sea salt or uh, other natural sources. So we, we are lucky, <laughs> in a sense. OK, thanks. And just to back to the point about the data availability, yeah, there's more and more sources of data becoming available all the time. Uh, I don't know who would be best placed to lead on that. Um, some of it's more useful than others. Um, um, for example, at the MOT data that comes out isn't really useful because they don't test for the right things at the MOT. For example, diesel vehicles are only tested for smoke opacity, so it's a very kind of crude test to see the levels of black smoke that's coming at the back of it. doesn't test at all for NO2, so we don't get any feedback from that. Um, there have been various pieces of uh, technology uh, coming onto the market that allow for as mentioned, real-time emissions testing without having to pull vehicles over and test them. It basically scans the plume that comes out the back of the vehicle and, and reports on it. How that feeds into the system, how we use that, still really to be figured out. But there's other data sources from things like um, monitoring Bluetooth travel times across the city. That can help feed into looking at ways of better resolving traffic congestion in real time, and that will have an impact on air quality. So it is being looked at. I don't know if it's been looked at, uh, you know, on a kind of wider basis for UK or Scotland wide, but it is being considered as, as part of the work that's being done to, to, to fully model the air quality impacts within the cities. OK, thank you. We need to move this on. Uh, John Scott. Um, thank you. Uh, I've got a um, particular question for Mark Sutton, um, and I would like to ask him what work um, CEH have done uh, to map and assess the impact of nitrogen emissions to air quality in Scotland, and what the results were if you've done that work. Uh, you may have already in part answered some of that, but there is a point to this series of questions. Okay. Um, the first off to say is that that work has primarily been focused on the United Kingdom scale, um, so it's under the lead of DEFRA and the devolved administrations contributing into that. The first step is working out what the emissions are and mapping those emissions. So we work together again with um, Ricardo AEA. Um, we particularly take responsibility for mapping the agricultural emissions and they will take responsibility on traffic sources, for example, and then sharing various other sources. Um, the first step is to know in agriculture, where are your sources? We start with the livestock census data um, at a parish level, um, and then with various land cover techniques, modeling that to get it into a gridded form. And those inventories then give us how much air pollution is coming out across Scotland. Um, for many of the sources, we have them at one kilometer grid resolution. Um, so there's emissions going up into the atmosphere, and then we're using atmospheric transport models to blow it around and let it come back down. That simulates the air concentrations and also the total amounts coming back down again as a deposition. So those are the kind of tools we're doing. And then I mentioned about the air quality monitoring, which provides a validation data to that. The intensive site, which is at Ockencorth near Pennycook, um, which is a, a rural site, is giving data of which we can then test these models, test their validity. So we have a, a clear view of what's coming up, uh, what's coming down, of course, necessarily with uncertainties as well, and, and uh, some understanding of those uncertainties. Thank you. Um, would you want to say anything, Scott Hamilton, about um, Ricardo's contribution to that monitoring or not? It's not, part, it's not a project I'm specifically involved in, so it'd probably be best to leave that to colleagues. Okay, right, thank you. I mean, do, uh, again, remark certain, I mean, what policy gaps might there currently be in that? Is there some way that that could be better enhanced and, and not just for you, given your wide knowledge of this, not just in agriculture? Yeah, um, well, I think in terms, if I, if I look at the bigger scale rather than the city scale, and, I, and I'm linking back here to discussions that I've contributed to in the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, 
and, and they signed a revision of the Gothenburg Protocol, um, and then the revision of the National Emissions Ceilings Directive, which followed that um, two years ago. And I look at the steps forward that countries have made. Um, they made further steps forward in reducing sulfur dioxide to the extent that sulfur dioxide emissions are so tiny now, by comparison, um, to the extent that farmers will often be needing to put some sulfur fertilizer on. But of course, that's okay because it means that the, the sulfur is not depositing onto the forest. We've largely got rid of our acid rain problem. So there was a reason for that. Um, the nitrogen oxides, again, they've committed to substantial further reductions. So um, how that is achieved, of course, that's up to the, the national plans. Um, but industrial sources making progress uh, in particular. I think, although I will keep coming back to agriculture, I have to do so uh, because the level of commitments made by the countries for agriculture have been very modest by comparison. And that, of course, is a social debate, particularly when you've got a subsidized industry that's doing its best to uh, make ends meet. Um, but quantitatively, much less ambition has gone into that. Um, so I'm not going to say what I can't say what is the way forward, what is the right way, because when I see a world with tough regulation, I see that that can be rather divisive as well, and it means that people sort of get stuck in the mud and not wanting to do something. Um, conversely, a world with incentives and let's all work together can be more constructive. But it's fair to say that the UK is, for example, committed to something like an 8% reduction in ammonia emissions by 2030, 8% reduction. Um, the Netherlands achieved a 50% reduction uh, between uh, 1993 and the present. Um, and so, you know, some countries have shown where they really were willing they could do things. The interesting thing is that the, the feedback I get from many stakeholders is, if you did that here, you would bankrupt us. And yet the interesting thing is that the Dutch farmers are still in business somehow, mysteriously. Um, and I think there's something much smarter going on here that we haven't really realized in this kind of should it be regulation or not or voluntary or whatever. It's how to gradually nudge forward the education towards smarter approaches that we wouldn't have otherwise thought about. So I, I can't say whether regulation is right or not, um, but I think we somehow have to be smarter in going forward so that people can see their opportunities, bearing in mind that much less has been done in the agricultural sector than in the, than in the car sector, than in the industry sectors. So whose role would you see that as being, the use of nudge theory, which I think most, Sorry, uh, I I think most farmers would be up for um, saving costs, doing things better, um, I mean, farmers essentially are also very much involved in food production, which is quite important, notwithstanding to uh, food security issues in terms of feeding our nation. So um, perhaps you'd like to talk a little bit more about the Netherlands, the situation in the Netherlands. What were the key barriers to development and implementation of this better mm. improved policy than the one which you say we have here? Yeah. Well, the, well, They've certainly gone a lot further, and so uh, the Netherlands agreed around 1993. They said all of our manure will be spread uh, into the soil rather than on the surface. So they committed to injection, and the deep injection of manure going into the soil surface. Um, in Denmark, um, they um, did that, but then not all the farmers wanted to inject. So um, other in the, as a thing developed, other people came up and said, we'll do a combination of acidifying our slurry together with a surface application in what is called a trailing hose. That means it goes out in nice, neat rows, so you've got the philosophy of precision farming, of getting it down nice and evenly, but you don't need the energy of getting the stuff into the soil. Now, those two policies on how we spread our muck are at the heart of what they've achieved. That's where the big achievement has come. But then onto that, then they've added good manure storage so that all their manures have a, have, uh, they don't have open manure storage at all. So they've committed to that. Um, of course, that comes down to how you design the system. Where if you've got an open lagoon, it's going to be much harder to cover it than if you've got a tank-based system. Um, to me, I think the question is, it's a long-term development as equipment turns over. Um, and, and that comes, of course, with the housing systems because when it comes to low emission animal houses, 
That tends to be the most expensive thing to do. They've committed to those as well, so you won't be operating a pig farm without scrubbing the air coming out the back of it if you're in Denmark or the Netherlands. Um, but the, that would be that you would, if you're going to rebuild your building in due course, make sure when you rebuild, rebuild with the latest technology. Um, you, they've gone to extreme lengths. Now, whether this is right or wrong, I don't know. I'm just reporting it. Um, because interestingly, some of the farmers decided they didn't want to run the scrubbers on their buildings. Um, so the, in, the, in the game of cat and mouse, the government came in and installed smart meters on the animal houses so they know they're actually being turned on. Is that good or bad? I don't know. It's certainly meaning that they're going to be uh, more diligent uh, in extremis of reducing the emissions. So let's com compare that. I think the first thing to realize is that they've got a, you've got a chain. You've got, and I would work back myself from the farmer perspective of this is manure, I want to use it well, start in the field, and I want to get the best out of it. So how can I get the best out of it? Is that meaning I'm going to buy myself some kit, or maybe I'm not a big enough farmer and I want to do some equipment sharing or even use contractors? Um, having done, made the best out of the muck I've got, I then want to say I want the best quality muck I can get, which means that it's not diluted with a mass of water, and it's not lost half of its goodness to the air, so can I have it in a store? So, for example, I have a, a friend, it's a very large uh, farm they're running, and they invested firstly in a low-emission manure spreader, a shallow injection system, and secondly in what they call slurry bags, massive pillows the size of this table into which your slurry is put, so it has zero em emissions. They've noticed first that the manure coming out of that slurry bag has better quality than when it went in because it's mobilized more inorganic nitrogen. And secondly, they're, they're getting it into the soil better. They found out now that they've got a greener crop and they're saving several tens of thousands a year on their fertilizer bill as a result. So in the end, I think this is actually pointing towards a world where we might look to training to farmers about how could you put this into your business plan that says you know, you've, you're going to invest in something this is an investment that ultimately you would want to pay back time on and that it could actually pay for itself in due course and give the confidence to know th that they can do that. Um, the bit I can't answer is a bit about ambition level. This is a bit like your question about how many deaths are acceptable from uh, particulate matter shortening of life and air pollution. Um, so that comes down to is what level of ambition do you want and how far do you want to get? That has to be a policy question. Um, Surely there's much that can be done in mobilizing um, through incentive schemes, through better education to take up these measures so that leading farmers are doing them and others see their friends doing the thing, I might do that too. Um, ultimately, if you really want to clean the air with a 50% level in a few years, I can't see any other way than you're going to do it by regulation. But that's, that's a social discussion. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the final question I want to ask is, I mean, who should be responsible for developing and implementing a nitrogen strategy in Scotland? And that, for everybody to answer. Uh, Briefly. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, nitrogen's going up into air pollution, is contributing to our greenhouse gas emissions through nitrous oxide, contributing to water pollution. To me, uh, I could imagine it being something that Scottish government convenes with lots of stakeholders, with SEPA, with academia, with farmers, to say, what is the evidence? How can we do this together? Uh, I just was last week in a meeting convened by Nourish Scotland, where many of the stakeholders were there, and they are, they are very keen on seeing this in the, the future climate change uh, revision uh, that, that you're looking at. Um, but I think it's clearly multi-actor. It needs everybody on board, but it needs somebody to hold, hold the handle, and I guess that would be Scottish Government. Thank you. Does any want to add to that, or do you tend to agree with those comments? See heads being nodded. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and the final uh, set of questions from Angus MacDonald. Okay, <coughs> thanks, um, convener. Um, I found that uh, section there fascinating, coming from a farming background myself. But if we can move on to uh, um, look briefly at um, the, the development planning issues and uh, the need for, for new housing. Um, now, we know that air quality isn't always, unfortunately, uh, considered a priority when it comes to development planning and transport planning. Um, so, um, 
do the panel members see any way of, of, of reconciling the need for, for new housing and related services with the rise in motorised travel? Anyone? I'm not sure if I fully understand the, what, what you're asking. Okay, the, well, there's, there's an issue um, with, um, you know, the de development sections in, in various local authorities, perhaps not a taking air quality as their priority. Um, and, you know, is there, a, is there any way of making sure that, that they do um, and dealing with the issue that new housing will uh, obviously attract um, increased motorised travel. For example, um, would the increased use of electric vehicles be the solution or would that not go far enough? Um, uh, certainly within Glasgow, it's a, a consideration that as part of the planning process when it comes in, we'll look at developments uh, and uh, if necessary require that a full assessment is carried out, air quality assessment uh, to support the uh, submission of the through the planning process. And... Um, We'll scrutinise that and see if it's likely to lead to any impact on air quality. If there is any uh, negative uh, impact, then we are looking for mitigation measures to be put in place to try and reduce that as much as possible. Um, but, I mean, again, through CAF's planning and placemaking is a key component of that. Uh, and, and, I mean, I'm not a planning officer, um, but there are um, you know, decisions being taken at the moment to look at um, how we develop the city, um, the, the adequate provisions in for sustainable transport, transport planning, uh, public transport provision, uh, and electric charging points if and where necessary. Um, some of the developments that are taking place at the moment are being granted with no parking provision at all, um, because it's recognised that we don't want to encourage people to bring additional vehicles into the city centre. So, I mean, um, it's, it's certainly, I think, further up the planning agenda now than it ever has been as a consideration in terms of air quality. thought to this, but what are the solutions to providing charging points in a city like Glasgow that has so many tenement buildings? Yeah, it's a challenge. It can be hubs. It can be localised hubs. Do we need as many petrol stations as, you know, as we go forward? A lot of them have been taken out of the city centre area. That could be a way of doing it. They are currently looking at the, I think it's called the Ruggedized project within Glasgow, which is looking to um, tap into streetlights as a means of, um, you know, instead of putting in brand new um, uh, electric charging points. Um, I mean, the technology will lead the way in what, what can be available. And as the market grows for, I mean, we are seeing quite a significant growth in electric vehicles. Um, that technology should make it um, available a variety of uh, new kind of innovative ways of, of charging vehicles in, in built up areas. It could be that um, you know we already have charging points within our multi story car parks that could be increased um, the charging points are put in um, uh, shopping centers and supermarkets and so on that that could be an area where it 's increased um, and of course, as engines uh, or sorry as batteries technology improves. Um, and the mileage uh, increases, you may not need to charge your vehicle every day. Mm. So uh, I think we wait and see. Um, okay. It's certainly being considered. It is a challenge for Glasgow, but um, it's something that's been looked at at the moment. Okay. That's good to know. Angus McDonald, do you have any further points? Uh, David Duffy. Sorry. sorry, David Duffy. I was just going to echo what um, Vincent has said, is experienced across the rest of Scotland, because, yes, obviously represent across the whole way. Um, the Scottish Government has given training for planners, in air quality, which is helping inform them to consider air quality more as an impactor. That also informs anyone who's actually contributing to a housing strategy with any of the local authorities. Um, the raised agenda of air quality within that also informs the um, local development plans. And as Vincent said, um, there is guides about where thresholds would be breached for housing size. So if there was a major new development, it would trigger the thought of where are those impacts. And planners, in my experience, through the networks and the pollution groups, are becoming more aware of that they can get um, agreements, either by better walkways, access to routes, monitoring before and after, um, not just within housing, but also in commercial settings where there are large scale developments. Um, certainly in my experience so far that that's further up the agenda within um, developmental control and also in, in housing developments. So, uh, 
So hopefully that will um, improve as we go on as the housing demands met. Okay, thanks. Sh should there be, for example, a condition in any planning application that's granted for houses, not uh, not uh, flats, that a a an EV charger must be in every drive? Is, is that a way? Depends. It de depends on the particular development that comes in, what the challenges, you know, where that's situated. It wouldn't be a bad thing. It wouldn't be a bad thing going forward because it's a lot more expensive to put these things in after the event than to put them in at the time when the, the building's been put in place. Um, and certainly, you know, if it was a new development within, within the city centre, a significant new development, we would be looking for charging points within it. But, I mean, I don't know if that's the case across Scotland and, and more rural and urban authorities, if it's even appropriate. Okay. David Duffy. Briefly, just to say, uh, uh, the other officer who helped contribute for uh, uh, Rehas's contribution works within Edinburgh City Council, and they have a strategy for delivering that and how they approach where the target threshold is for deciding whether um, EV points will go in. Um, Rehas took the opportunity and we bought one um, and helped put one in. Um, that we just Rehas badged because it was a good contribution, but it was through Edinburgh City Council's strategy of delivering that. So perhaps other local authorities can learn from uh, their strategy. Okay, and with regard to retrofitting, how much would one of these cost? Um, I'm not sure about retrofitting. I know that the one that Rehas paid for, um, the total cost was under 5,000, but it's very dependent upon which type of unit you purchase. Um, it's fast charge, soft charge. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, okay, thanks. Thank you. Mark Roscoe, very briefly. Examples of planning applications that have been turned down as a result of impact on air quality or housing allocations that have been shifted within a local development plan within Glasgow or elsewhere? I'm not aware of any at the moment that have been, or, or recently that have been refused. Um, I mean, there is a change in how applications come in now. You know, a lot of them are front loaded that they have considered air quality and that they have designed it or looked to mitigate the impact of the, the, the development taking place. So, I mean, we sometimes go back with suggestions for conditions that go on planning consent. Um, but I mean, I'm not aware of any, say, within the past. 10 years now have necessarily been refused purely on air quality conditions. Um, <clears throat> there, uh, there an example that I was involved in in Perth um, in 2011-12 um, was uh, uh, essentially a domestic uh, waste, uh, waste after treatment uh, incinerator that was planned for Perth City Centre and I was the expert witness on behalf of the council and the development was uh, rejected by the Scottish government's reporter on air quality grounds and odour. But so that was a specific case, but it was an industrial facility. Not a... okay. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time this morning. It has been fascinating. Um, if you have any further thoughts that come to mind, uh, please share them by way of follow-up emails, if that's okay. And uh, perhaps on a personal note, these trees that aren't trees in Glasgow, I'd be quite quite interested in the location. So the next time I visit the city, and I promise to travel by public transport and not bring my polluting diesel, I could perhaps visit them. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Okay. The uh, third item on our agenda today, uh, we'll see the committee consider the following negative instruments the development of water resources, designated bodies, modification, Scotland regulation 2017, SSI 2017 forward slash 347, and the water and sewerage services to dwellings, collection of unmetered charges by local authorities, Scotland amendment uh, order 2017, SSI 2017 forward slash 348. I refer members to the papers and I invite any comments. Uh, Richard Lyle. Right, I noticed that uh, this relates to the water sewage services to dwellings collection of unmetered charges by local authority it makes each local authority responsible for the collection of charges payable for water services, sewage services provided by Scottish Water to dwellings in their council <coughs> area. And that amends the 2014 order, extends it for a further two years from 2018 to 2020. Also note that negotiations are concluded that at Cosler's request during the two-year extension period, the Scottish Government will carry out a formal review of the collection options to inform the next order. This review should get underway later this year. But I also hope that this review will show that um, this should stay with councils uh, after the review. I note that the total amount deducted for the cost of collection in relation to services provided in each financial year was fixed at £18.25 
and by my calculations, on average, each council will get over a half a million pounds for collection and warrant charges. And I hope this will stay with councils as an additional uh, um, uh, added uh, revenue for councils. Okay. Thank you, convener. Okay. Does any, anyone else have any comments to make on these instruments? No. Um, so, is, if, given that the committee does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments, that's duly noted. The fourth item on the agenda is for the committee to consider uh, petition PE1636 by Michael Trail, which calls on the Scottish Government to urge the uh, sorry calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to introduce legislation requiring all single-use cups to be 100% biodegradable. Credible. Details of the committee's previous work on the petition are set out in the papers, uh, which suggest a range of possible options available to members. Can I uh, invite any comments and suggestions on ways forward? John Scott. Um, thank you. Um, well, I welcome uh, the letter um, from uh, the minister in this regard, Minister Rosanna Cunningham. Um, um, and I think I welcome the fact that uh, Zero West Scotland are to look into this and also that there's a new expert panel uh, to be appointed to look into this to see if something uh, can be done to reduce the impact of uh, this problem. Um, and I think that's very much uh, good progress on behalf of the government. Um, so I'm happy that that is happening. Um, I think we should keep the petition open and um, consider it uh, from time to time, uh, at least until such time as the, the government have firmly taken up the baton, so to speak, and are starting to run with it. And after that, uh, once that has happened, I think the, the, the work of the petition and the petitions committee and it, it has been done. But I, I would keep it open just for the time being, just to encourage the government to remember it, so to speak. OK. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just uh, very briefly to um, support what um, my colleague John Scott's saying and also to highlight that um, this is one of a range of ways in which we can be reducing waste but also um, simplifying waste for the future. And I think um, it, it, this will help to focus minds um, on this is one of the options and an important one, but there are a whole range of other ways in which we can have um, simpler packaging, uh, although there are things that we certainly still will be needing packaging for. So I, I would support it being kept open to help focus minds. Okay. Any other views? Uh, no, I'm not saying so. Are we content to take Mr Scott's suggestion as a way forward? We are, we are indeed. Um, at its next meeting uh, on the 21st of November, the committee will consider subordinate legislation in stage two of the Wild Animals in Travelling Circuses Scotland Bill. As agreed earlier, we will now move into private. I ask that the public gallery be cleared as the public part of the meeting is closed.